Hey there, welcome to Redacted. What can I get for you today? The fat man across the counter didn't respond. He instead stared up behind me with squinted eyes, a smack in his lips as if he was already eating our sodium rich garbage. I waited patiently with a smile while he continued to gawk at the menu. What does a combo come with? Well, sir, our combos come with one of our main menu items, your choice of side and one of our refreshing fountain drinks. I responded with a smile. The man still didn't bother to look at me. He smacked his lips and then said, Um, I'll have three combos. Okay, sir, what would you like for the mains? Um, I want one with fries, one with onion rings, and one with coleslaw. Excellent choice, sir. But for the mains, two Cokes, one Sprite, all large. Uh, sir, could you please actually make one of the fries a large? Sir, the way this works is I need to hit the main buttons first. And then I want five packets of your sweet chili sauce that I can ring in, actually. And hey, what does it say I'm being charged two dollars for sauce? Uh, sir, we have a small fee on all our sauce packets that don't come with a main meal. It's been in effect for her. I'm not paying $2 for sauce packets. He was looking at me now, all right. Uh, okay, well. Hey, Johnny. Some skinny kid with overdone hair suddenly said, slapping my arm. I notice you don't have gloves on. I got you, uh. I don't need gloves to work cash. Hey, I'm talking to you. Sir, if you will. Johnny, gloves. I don't need gloves. Hello? Hey, quit holding up the line. Some lady chimed in from out the door. Oh, screw off, you old hag. Sir, please, I'll take the sauce out of the order. Now, can you just... What the heck did you just call me? I don't have to pay for sauce with my meal boy. And you heard me back there. Johnny, is there a problem? Patty said, running out of his office. He doesn't want to pay for the sauce. I shouldn't have to if it's with a meal. Okay, sir, just calm down, Terry said, taking over my till. What meal did you want exactly? Chicken fingers, I wanted. Oh, come on, I screamed. Thank you and have a good day, I said to the woman, with the truest smile that I had had all day. For a while I was ringing in her order, I watched that clock tick to the magical hour that marks me being finally able to go home. There was a smile that stuck on my face as I walked away from the till, grabbed my coat and was immediately wiped off my face when Patty approached me and said, Hey Johnny, can I talk to you for a minute? Patty's office was this little nook in the restaurant that probably was intended to be a closet. Even with his chair pushed all the way into the corner of the wall, and me clinging onto the door, we maybe had less than a foot of space between us. Patty sighed, staring at the floor and biting his lap, while I stood trying to keep the doorknob from poking my back. He wasn't the kind of man that I could ever come to respect, but out of all the bosses that I've had, he really wasn't that bad. Look... I started to say when he declined to speak. About today, you, you gotta understand. Buddy wise, he raised a hand. It's done, Johnny. Not worth reliving it. He still wouldn't look me in the eye. Oh, I replied. So, why am I here then? He paused another moment, staring ahead. Raymond quit, he finally said. Oh, hey, good for him. He finally looked up to me with a discerning face at that. He was one of the only two shift managers who could work nights, and Abdul already has so many hours in that well. He looked away again and let out another sigh. Johnny, would you like a promotion? I paused for a minute. What? Patty sighed again. You're the most experienced out of everyone here, and I need someone to cover for tomorrow night. So... I get, uh, I get to be in charge. Do you think you can handle it, Johnny? I smiled. Patty sighed, shaking his head. First things first, he said. 
and grabbing a piece of paper off his desk and handing it to me. Night shift is a bit different than what you're used to during the day. We've got um a few extra rules that you'll need to follow. My smile faded. Now I know some of those might seem silly, Johnny, but I'm telling you now. It's imperative that you follow everything on the list to a T. You also need to make sure the other employees follow them as well, seeing as you'll be the boss. I'm leaving my personal number as well as Abdul's at the bottom of the page. In case you have any questions or something comes up, you got this, Johnny? I looked down at the list and then back up to Patty. Then, using a trick taught to me by my dear brother and mastered through the art of fast food service, I put on my best smile. Got it. I pulled my beater into our shady little lot, marching my way in with my best smile and my new black-colored uniform. Jerry, the evening manager, greeted me with a blank face. The growing black circles under his eyes really said more than his expression. Patty wanted me to ask, you read the night shift rules. Nope, I replied. You see, a long time ago I had been hired by a company for a security position, in which I had also been given a list of rules. After having lost said list, I later found them crumpled in my pocket, just when I happened to be searching for emergency toilet paper. Since then, it's become one of my life's mottos. My only good use for a list of rules is toilet paper. He shrugged and grabbed his coat. Alright then, I'm off. Try not to blow the place up, Johnny. 11.03 p.m. Ding. The drive through headset rang in my ear. A smile crept across my face as I turned on my mic. Good evening and welcome to a stroke on the go. How, how can I... I began to snicker uncontrollably as the rest of the staff stared at me. Um, hi? The man said on the other end as I continued to chuckle. Can I get a number 13 large? Um... I turned to one of the crew. What's number 13? I was going to ask you. Crap, can someone look at the menu? The skinny kid that had pestered me about the gloves the previous day rushed over to the counter and stared at the menu. Uh, Johnny, I don't, I don't think we have a number 13. No, uh, uh, sir, we don't have a 13. Is there something else you might want? Uh, I see it right on the menu. We're out of that item, sir. Sir, a girl with red hair pulled open the window and peered out. Um, I think he left, she said. Uh, well, one less problem for us, I replied with a smile. 11.37 p.m. Okay, seriously, this is going to start to get awkward if I don't know any of your names. What are you people called? Cassie, said the red-haired girl. Toby, the skinny kid said with a smile. Uh, name's Niles, said the chubby man who flipped burgers. Cool, I replied. So how many of you have worked the night shift before? No one said anything, other than the skinny kid who started going off about being new, but I ignored him. Wonderful, alright, this is how it's gonna work. No one snitches to Patty and we all. Another ding. The front door ringed as it opened. Okay, seriously, guys. Did no one lock the door? You never told us to, said Cassie. Wait, we locked the door? I thought we were 24-7, said the skinny boy. Drive through only at night, Niles chimed in. From the front of the restaurant, a pair of heels clicked rapidly across the floor as this tiny little figure trotted away up to the counter. She looked at us and smiled. Alright, it's okay, guys. I got this. I approached the woman who still held her grin. Hi, she said. I would like to get... Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, but the interior of the restaurant closed at 11. My underlings just forgot to lock up. If you would like, however, you can walk yourself around to our drive through window, squat down and hold your hands out like you're driving a tiny invisible car. And my fine workers will be more than happy to provide artery-clogging nourishment to you and your imaginary vehicle. She paused for a moment, still holding the grin. I don't think she even blinked. Hi, she said again. The pitch a tad higher this time. I would like to get... I'm sorry, madam, but as I just said, we can... The Susan special, 
She spoke over to me. Extra rare, if you will. I stared at her for a moment. You want a what now? Susan special. Her lips stretched a little wider. Extra rare. Okay, first of all, I don't know when the heck that is, and second, you want it rare? Seriously, lady, I know you probably haven't seen where the food comes from, but I'm pretty sure my boss just tips the inspector. And third, like I said, we closed in the restaurant, no service here, bye-bye. What happened next is what started to make me feel uncomfortable. See, I was expecting this lady to maybe get upset and ask for the manager. Only for me, with all my enthusiasm, to inform her of my new status and kick her butt to the curb. A fantasy that I've had for so long, I'm honestly shocked that I've never acted on it. The smile didn't go away though, instead. She tilted her head slightly and slowly, like maybe she was a bit confused. It kept going though, bending until it was a full 90 degrees sideways. I would really like this special now. I'm in a hurry. I looked to the rest of the crew who are now watching this whole ordeal and then back to the lady. Okay, I said with a sigh. I'm gonna make this clear for you. No. <laughs> In an instant, the smile was gone and suddenly she snarled, lunging over the counter and grabbing onto my uniform, pulling in for a bite. Oh, Jesus Christ, I yelled out, doing my best to hold her off. What the heck? Cassie screeched. Oh sh- oh! Help! Someone help! She's freaking rabid! I hollered, as her fingers started clawing at my face. Uh, gosh dang it, Toby! Get the mop! Uh, the mop! Just grab it, Toby! And a big chomp. Rawr! I screamed as she bit into my arm. Toby ran into the back, nearly crashing into Niles who was running out of the kitchen for help. Niles ran beside me and grabbed her by the arms, trying to force her off. Holy crap, she's strong, he said. Hey, you're telling me, buddy. Toby ran back out, clutching the mop tightly to his chest. Okay, okay, what do I do? What do I... Hit her, Toby. What? Don't just stand there, whack her. Well, but will I get in? Gosh dang it, Toby, whack the lady. She snarled again, flinging bits of saliva onto my face. And Toby ran in and slammed the mop on her, and when she didn't let go, we hit her again and again and again and again and again. Cassie finally flew in and punched her straight in the nose, finally breaking me free. Keep hitting, I yelled. Whack, smack, bam, kablam. Unified and working with such teamwork, it would probably make our franchise's master really happy. We punted that savage madwoman all the way across the room and right out the door which the four of us promptly pushed shot, and with a satisfying click, the demon Karen left to bang and slobber all over the glass. You'll pay for this, she screeched. I want my special and I want it now. Now! No special for you. Johnny, Niall said, putting a hand on my arm. Johnny, maybe don't taunt her. Is that glass gonna hold? Cassie asked. More bamming. Now! Uh, I said, I sure hope so. Should I call the police? The skinny kid asked. Nah, I think she'll probably get bored. What? Why not? No cops while I'm in charge, Toby. That's one of my rules. Don't question it. 12.30 AM. Why can't we call the cops? I said don't question it, Cassie. Bruh, that woman just went full on primal on your butt. How can you not? No questioning, me, manager. But she's still, eh. Uh, Niles trailed off. I looked back out the door. The woman was nowhere to be seen. See, I said. Solved itself, no need for cops. Alright everyone, back to the normal things. I went behind the counter and I helped myself to a free soda. Cassie pulled herself under the drive through window and went back on her phone. Niles did something, I'm sure it was important and the skinny kid just started following me around. Uh, sir, he said, while I began to pour my drink. What do you want, Toby? I'm just not really sure what to do, I sighed, and this guy was determined to be one of those types. I don't know, man, go clean the bathroom or something. It sounds like something we're supposed to do. Okay, right away. A delighted smile spread across his face as soon as I gave the order. I let out another sigh as soon as he ran off. 
Uh, guys? Cassie suddenly called out. Anyone else just lost service? I whipped out my phone. Huh, mine's gone too. Niles? Johnny, he suddenly hollered. Niles, me and Cassie lost service, did you? Never mind that, just come here. I walked into the kitchen with Cassie following behind me. Niles was staring dumbfounded at one of the grills in the corner of the room. This was not here when we came in. What? This grill? I'm pretty sure that we have grills, Niles. We have three, Johnny, three, and there are four now. Okay, Niles, buddy. You holding on me. I won't snitch, but Sharon is Karen, bro. No, Johnny, he's right. Cassie butted in. We have three grills at least. I thought we did. Okay, well, that's weird then. Bruh, this kind of stuff, it doesn't happen. The drive through headset went off again. Hey, Cassie, can you go get that? I said before turning back to Niles. Well, buddy, I guess find out if it works. 1.37 a.m. Hey, where the heck did Toby go? Cassie suddenly asked me. I sent him to go clean the bathroom. Like, what, an hour ago? Yeah, so... Um, maybe you should go check on him? I sighed, sat up, and strolled over to the washroom. Hey, Toby, Toby, you... Holy crap! My jaw dropped to the floor as I opened that door. It was, well, let's put it this way. Imagine you were to take a purse and turn them inside out and then blow them up. If this doesn't paint the picture for you, imagine blood and bits of brain and flakes of skin covering the walls. Organs hanging off the toilet the garbage can, the mirror end of the diaper station. Man, the skeleton had the legs blown clean off. I don't know what happened to him. The torso, however, was upside down head first into the toilet bowl. On the mirror was a nice little message. We should have given her the special. Johnny, Johnny, what is... Oh my god! Cassie shrieked. Cassie, Cassie, what the heck do we do? Oh my god, oh my god. Hey guys, is everything... Oh! Niles didn't scream when he entered the room like me and Cassie. Instead, he went stiff like a plank. Didn't talk, didn't move, just stood there, taking it all in. Okay, he finally said. I'm calling the cops. No, I screamed. No cops, none. The heck do you mean? Toby looks like he just went through a freaking blender. Just uh, look. I may or may not have been trying to sell some blow to the cop back in Alberta. And yeah, I don't want to move again, Niles. Let's just... I slowly closed the bathroom door. There, like we never saw it. And the morning crew can deal with it. Yeah, Niles said. I'm calling the cops. No, Niles, no. Don't try to stop me, Johnny. Niles, I'm acting manager if you don't stop. I promise there will be a very strongly worded letter. Niles didn't reply. He picked up our landline and began dialing. Hello, he said. I'm calling from... Arr! Niles' eyes shot wide as I charged him, tackling the oaf to the ground. Johnny, what the... I said, don't do it, Niles, I said. Get off. No. Hello, hello, yes. Is this the police? Oh, crap, Cassie. Cassie, no. I dropped Niles to run at her, only for him to grab me from behind. I got him. Get them over here. No, I said no, I say. Yes, we're at... I'm sorry, how do you know my name? I stopped struggling. Niles stopped yelling, though he didn't let go. Cassie turned to look at us, and the phone still pressed to her ear. Her eyes were as wide as dinner plates. Suddenly, she slammed the phone down. It... it was her, she said. 2.13 a.m. Her? The one crazy lady, I exclaimed, still in Niles chokehold. Poor Cassie didn't reply, just let out a frightened whimper and nodded her head. Suddenly, Niles dropped me. I fell hard on the floor. That's it, he said. Johnny, tell Patty that I quit. I'm getting the heck out. Hold that thought, Niles, I replied. We'll leave a sick note. I say this is getting too spooky for me, too. Same, said Cassie. The three of us marched away out the door and into the parking lot. Well, what the... explained Niles. Hey, guys, does anyone else remember the parking lot being this big? It was like it went on forever. Endless parking spaces, endless eerie nightlights. Where this the city would be, my dream come true. 
Currently, however, it made me feel concerned that we hadn't really left the restaurant and also couldn't find my car. 2.45 AM. Niles, Niles, I called out into the kitchen. The last time I had entered, we counted 42 microwaves, 72 fryers, and 102 grills. Now looking into it was like staring into a jungle of unnecessary kitchen appliances. Somewhere in that mess, I could smell the meat cooking. Didn't really want to go in though. 3.35 AM. We managed to bandage Niles' wounded arm with the packaging for our hamburgers, using the sweet and sour sauce as glue. According to him, some of the appliances inside the kitchen came to life and formed a primitive yet sophisticated society, aside from the fact they weren't above eating human flesh. If you ask me, however, I don't really blame the microwave society for thinking us as food. We are a different species as them, and though intelligent, I myself enjoy a nice octopus when the opportunity arises. So who am I to judge? Still, we have sealed off the kitchen by throwing chairs in front of the door. Cassie has sharpened all the mop handles to fine points, and Niles stole one fryer, so we have hot grease in our arsenal. And we also had to push the ice cream machine in front of the drive through window. Understandably, Cassie and I reacted poorly when the first customer showed up with no face. Like, why even get food if you don't have a mouth? After that experience, we decided to just tell everybody that we were closed, and they didn't like that. Anyways, the Friar Niles took just asked what the purpose of its existence was. 4.01 AM, the roaches and the mice have allied themselves. They have claimed the soda fountain. 4.13 AM, Toby's alive. Apparently the idiot was cleaning the other washroom as we fell asleep, and the shadow men woke him up. They were spooky at first, but his manager, I'm enforcing a strict, don't talk to them policy, which seems to be working. I wish they would keep it down though. 4.24 AM. It wasn't Toby. 4.49 AM. We were forced to retreat into the appliance jungle. An angry customer pulled the ice cream machine through the wall. Once he actually had it, he left with it, saying that it was all he really wanted. But suddenly, being exposed to the unending line of customers we had been neglecting for over an hour, we decided to brave the microwaves. That and war had broken out between the Pest Alliance and the Shadow People, and though it looked like neither side was actually winning, no one felt like getting caught in the crossfire. Currently, we were scavenging for french fries in the Friar wetlands. Though our hunt was very successful, the Friars had been requesting us to leave. Also, I swear, somewhere in the grill forest, I can hear the beeping. 5.30 AM We barely escaped the kitchen alive. On the service floor, the casualties from the war have been many. It appears that there were in fact no survivors. The drive through lineup appears to have subsided though. No more cars, just an empty, endless parking lot stretching into the void. I don't like looking into it. And there was also a message left for us next to the register. Crudely scratched into the counter, it read, I want my special. We are resharpening the mop handles. 5.59 AM. The cow goes. We all die in the end, Johnny. All of us, even you, even Kelly, even Sawyer. Nothing but dust in the wind on a dying planet in a dying universe. Adams age to Johnny and their bonds weaken. Their energy wanes and soon, all that is left is the ash of what was. Except for Susan, Johnny. Susan is special. Special Susan wants Susan special. You should have given Susan her special, Johnny. <laughs> Silly murder cow, me manager. No special for you, Susan. 7 a.m. Johnny! Ah! I screamed, kicking back and preparing to flee from the monstrosity. Only to see Patty staring down at me. Johnny, are you okay? What the heck happened? Oh, it was all an awful dream. God, Patty, you wouldn't. Why are we outside? Johnny... He cut me off. Where's the restaurant? I stood up and whipped around. We were in the parking lot, where the restaurant used to be. However, there was nothing but dirt. Leveled, pancake flat dirt with nothing, but the drive through menu sticking out of the ground. 
Uh, I stammered. Well, you see, the thing is... Johnny! Patty said, staring dead ahead into the void that used to be our fine restaurant. You're fired. During the summer break of my junior year of high school, I worked as a McDonald's employee. I was 17 and pretty naive at the time. I desperately needed money to add to my college fund. My parents did not plan it out so well, so there was a really high chance that I wouldn't go to college if I didn't get a job. I was mostly busy during the whole day. I was a day person and wasn't very productive at night. During the daytime, I was either hanging out with friends, working out, studying, or learning or practicing for coding competitions to add to my portfolio. And usually at nighttime, I wasn't really doing anything. The most productive thing at night that I did was just some plain old written homework. Because of the reasons I mentioned above, and because of the fact that I didn't really sleep a lot at night, only about 3 or 4 hours a night, I decided to take out two birds with one stone and take a night shift job. That way, I could get paid for doing absolutely zero mental work and get my homework done at the same time. I applied at a lot of different places, but I have to admit, I was a big fan of fast food. So, fast food jobs were on the top of my priority list. So, when I got the job at a McDonald's, it was a no-brainer for me. This McDonald's was located a bit on the outskirts of town, probably for travelers or passerbys, but I didn't mind it as long as I was getting paid. And with it being isolated, it also meant that there would be comparatively fewer customers than one that was located in the city. So, I might even get a chance to squeeze in another hour of sleep. I got into my dad's car and I went to the store. It looked pretty dreary. The outside walls had a bit of mold on them. I entered into the small building, only to be greeted by a middle-aged man standing behind the counter. He greeted me with a big smile and a nod of acknowledgement. He took me to the drive through booth, where I would be receiving orders, and he explained how everything worked. You know, the ice cream machines, even though they might always be broken. The soft drink dispensers and the fryers. After he had given a quick tour of the building, he brought me back to the counter, took a deep breath, and said, Hey kid, do you believe in ghosts and stuff? No, but why do you ask? I inquired. Alright, I know, I know. I'm gonna sound absolutely insane for this one. But you're gonna have to follow some rules while working here. Now, I know all of them sound unbelievable. But trust me, they are as real as it gets. They could even cost you your life if you don't follow them. I looked at him, puzzled. What are the rules? And has anyone ever been hurt or something? I said. He pulled out his phone. He had multiple photos of other people who formerly had worked there, but apparently ignored the rules and have gone missing since. Well, why don't you just go to the police then? I asked him interrogatively. I've tried. Nobody believes me, he said, his voice getting shaky. They'll conduct a full area search, but they think I'm insane. He almost burst into tears, but he composed himself 
and he begged me to follow the rules and to take them seriously. I told him that I would, and his face lit up. He handed me the list of rules, thanked me, and laughed. I reluctantly smoothed out the piece of paper, and I started to read. List of rules to survive the McDonald's night shift. Rule number one. Keep the lights on the drive through counter. That's where you'll hand customers their food. At all times. With an exception to rule number five. There is a creature just lurking nearby. Waiting for the lights to go out and for you to let your guard down. Rule number two. There are security cameras next to the counter. Always check who is in the drive thru If the person ordering is in a black Range Rover with tinted windows, do not speak a word to him. He will eventually stop bothering you if you ignore his angry threats and he will drive away in a few minutes. If you speak to him, however, he's going to break into your booth and go after you like a wild animal. God only knows what entity he is that can mimic a human voice so perfectly. Rule number three. If somebody orders french fries, tell them that you're all out because you do not want to open a bag of frozen fries at midnight. Trust me on that. The scent will attract unwanted attention, and it'll end well for no one. Rule number four. If you hear your name being called from behind you, stop everything that you're doing, lay down, and close your eyes. You might feel the slightest sensation of teeth on your limbs, or giant talons rubbing against your head or torso. But please, please do not move. It'll be gone after you hear a demonic giggling. Rule number five. If you see a five-year-old girl with no eyes, standing in the drive through looking directly at the camera, lock all the doors and windows and turn off all the lights. You might hear screaming, roaring, and screeching from outside. Once it's been a minute since all the sounds have ceased, turn the lights back on and continue on with your job. Rule number six. If you hear people in the main dining area, do not go check it out. No one is out there, since the place will already be locked. It's just another distraction by the creature lurking nearby. Rule number seven. If the lights go out by themselves, chop off a toe or a finger and place it on the drive through counter and duck behind it. Shortly after, you'll hear low growls, followed by a quick snatching sound. Get up once the lights are back and check the counter. If your finger or toe is missing, congratulations, you're going to live to see another day. If your finger or toe is still there, just pray to God that it ends you quickly and doesn't take its time cherishing your fear. Rule number eight. It is advised that you do not sleep, because then you could miss your name being called, or the five-year-old girl, or the laughing and talking sounds of people in the dining area, which could cost you your life. I was puzzled. If this was all a joke, well then, it was a terrible one. I thought to myself, just before noticing movement in one of the bushes in the drive through You know how you think you can be brave and fight through the fear during a fight-or-flight situation. Well, nope. 
your body actually seizes up when facing the fear head on without a warning. Somewhere in my heart, I believe that this had to be a fake list or an elaborate prank by the employees. But I didn't want to take any chances, so I decided to just go along with all the rules. For the first hour of the night, literally nothing paranormal happened. I didn't even get a customer until then. Well, this is going to be easier than I thought. I sighed and spoke to myself, flipping through the security cameras every 20 minutes. I almost didn't notice the little girl peeking through a bush, her eye sockets devoid of any eyes. I looked at them, and they seemed void of any human emotion. They were evil in a strange way. The more that I looked into them, the more that I felt like I wanted to cry. I was so fixated, I couldn't tear my gaze. It felt like we locked eyes forever, and it was so long that I almost forgot to turn the lights off, but I did remember rule number five. I got underneath the counter after turning them off. Soon, I heard something slam against the left wall of the booth, like it was something big, and it had lashed out and tried to break through the wall. Then I heard quick little footsteps, followed by the cries of a young girl. The cries kept on increasing in intensity. It got to the point where I thought that I would actually lose my hearing and go deaf. I covered my ears, but could obviously still hear the little girl's cries. After what seemed like forever but was probably only about 30 seconds, the cries ceased, and then I heard a low growl. The growl was followed by the sounds of roaring and slashing of meat. They were so disgusting and I couldn't contain it anymore, and I threw up all over the floor. After collecting myself mentally, I got up and turned the lights all back on. I cleaned up the mess that I had made, and I contemplated what I had just been through. Before I even had time to finish thinking about what had happened, I heard people talking out in the main lobby. The noise was very distant, I couldn't make out any of the words or what they were saying. Just laughs, giggles, and overlapping voices. The night was eerily silent, so I could hear every little thing that went bump in the night. I was just about to go take a look and see what all the commotion was, when I remembered some of the rules regarding this specific event. I reread the list and I found it. It was rule number six. I had to just ignore it and it would eventually go away. And so that's what I did. I put in my headphones and I started with some overdue homework. Almost one hour passed. Nothing happened. When finally a customer came through the drive through I served them. And I was happy that there were actually people starting to come now. Soon, I saw another car pulling up. I was really happy now. I wasn't alone in this horrible place any longer. But my good mood was immediately put off when I saw that it was a black Range Rover with tinted windows. I didn't speak to the angry man on the other side of the drive through window. He screamed his order, and then said, I know you're in there. What are you, deaf? Listen to me. I didn't reply, and I kept my cool. Fifteen minutes later, and it was gone. My shift is over, and now I'm sitting here typing this, 
contemplating if this job is really worth $200 a day or not. I wanted to quit, but the manager begged me not to and told me that he would double my pay since I was so good at the job. But I don't want to risk my life again. Today's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. Whether you're trying to save money, eat better, or stress less, HelloFresh is here to help you do all three. Say hello to your most delicious year yet with fresh ingredients and chef-crafted recipes at a price that you like, delivered right to your door. No more staring blankly in the fridge wondering what to make for dinner. Give HelloFresh a try and dig into their biggest menu yet, with over 45 recipes to choose from each week. I just had the mushroom and herb at shepherd's pie, topped with white cheddar mashed potatoes and it was absolutely delicious. I wish that I could have it for dinner again tonight. To get started, go to hellofresh.com slash mrcreepsfree and use code mrcreepsfree for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while the subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at hellofresh.com slash mrcreepsfree with code mrcreepsfree. HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. Hey there, I'm Jason. I'm German and I'm in the army. The 12th Motor Brigade. I know, interesting, huh? I didn't think so, and things weren't interesting for a while, until yesterday. I'm here to tell you my three-year experience at Site Omega, from driving a patrol and inspecting trucks carrying suspicious cargo, to being put on guard duty at the base proper. So this mess all started when the Sarge came up to me and said, Look, Jace, you've done a lot for the regiment and I thank you, but I need to ask you a favor. I need you on night patrol duty. What? I began. Now, I wouldn't have asked you if we had someone else available, but Heinrich's on leave. Carl's recovering from injuries and Fritz. Well, let's not talk about him. You'll find instructions that I've written for you in the Hummer. See you tomorrow. And with that, he walked off. The next night, I got into the Hummer and was just about to start when I suddenly remembered the note that Sarge had left for me. I got it out of the cup holder out of all places. Here's what it said. Good evening, Jason. First off, I want to make one thing completely clear. This is not by any means a joke. You know I don't do jokes and your life may very well depend on it. Rule 1. Do not, under any circumstances, get out of the Hummer. Ever. With the exception of rule number 5. Rule number 2. If the radio on the Hummer crackles to life, answer it. And if you hear anything other than my voice, shut it off. They are trying to locate you. Rule number three. The patrol route is clearly marked with yellow signs. If you see any sign other than yellow, stop the Hummer and radio the base. We'll come and resolve the issue. Rule number four. You'll most likely encounter an old man. Stop and ask him what he's doing. If he says that he's lost, point him in the direction of the nearest town, which is three clicks due west of here. If he says anything else, floor it. Run him over if you need to. Rule number five. If by any point you need to go to the washroom, do it in under three minutes, because that's the time that it takes for them to find you. Rule number six. If you encounter another Hummer during the patrol, hail them. If they respond, continue as usual. If not, stop the Hummer, shut off the engine, and pray to God that they didn't see you. Rule number seven. If you see anyone on the final third of the patrol, take the Glock 19 out of the glove compartment and shoot them, no matter who they are. If you haven't shot within two minutes of seeing them, you're screwed. Rule number eight. If at any point your Hummer breaks down, radio the base immediately and someone will come pick you up. Rule number nine, the most important one too. If you return to the base and see yourself waiting in your spot, 
contact security immediately and request that you be put in protective custody. The guards will understand and they will tell you once they've dealt with the situation. And lastly, be careful out there. We've lost two soldiers out there already. Don't become the third. Good luck, Sarge. Okay, so what did I just read? I thought to myself. Never mind, just get on with it. And so I started out on the patrol, with the guards in the towers holding their hands in some sort of prayer, and then they waved me through. The first few hours were peaceful, with the yellow signs telling me which part of the patrol that I was on. And I was at the one-fifth mark when the radio crackled to life, and it nearly made me hit my head on the roof. Number two, if the radio and the Hummer crackles to life, answer it. And if you hear anything other than my voice, shut it off. They're trying to locate you. I almost lunged for the receiver and held it up to my ear. It was a woman weeping on the other end. I was paralyzed. I was trying to compose myself when the weeping turned into amused laughter. God dang it. I slammed the receiver down so hard that I cracked the case and I booked it the heck out of there. I was petrified and I didn't snap out of it until the one third mark and that's when I noticed the signs were blue. Number three. The patrol route is clearly marked with yellow signs. If you see any sign other than yellow, stop the Hummer and radio the base. We'll come and resolve the issue. I slammed on the brakes and immediately radioed the base. Come in, come in, I said. I'm on patrol and I noticed that these signs are blue. Roger that, Sarge said. Someone's on their way now. By the way you seem on edge, is anything wrong? He asked. Nope, I lied not telling him what had happened. Everything's as fine as it should be, Sarge said. Okay then, well, someone's on their way. They'll reach your location in five minutes, hold tight. After what seemed like two decades, a jeep pulled up and someone stopped out. He told me to cover my eyes and ears and then proceeded to do some stuff that would likely result in me being banned if I described it. The next few miles were not eventful, except where I saw another Hummer in the road. Thankfully, when I hailed them, they responded. So, there's rule number six out of the way for now. When I got to the final one-third of the patrol, I was on edge. I thought that I heard screams from the woods, but I shrugged it off and kept on going. I had to slam on the brakes to avoid running over my wife. What the... I began to think, when I remembered. Number seven... If you see anyone on the final third of the patrol, take the Glock 19 out of the glove compartment and shoot them, no matter who they are. If you haven't shot them within two minutes of seeing them, you're screwed. FML. I reached for the gun, but I couldn't do it. Her eyes were begging me not to, and I didn't want to, but I knew that I had to or else I was dead. Tears rolling down my cheeks, I leaned out and I pulled the trigger. I cursed to no one in particular. I just drove on with the knowledge of what I had done to my own wife. Now things were getting serious. I was approaching the spot where I saw him, or rather, me. I was just standing there, with a too wide, malicious smile on my face. Number 9. If you return to the base and see yourself waiting in your spot, contact security immediately and request that you be put in protective custody. The guards will understand and will tell you once they've dealt with the situation. And so I called the guards and they asked me what was wrong, and I just pointed at me since I was too shocked. The guards glanced from me to me and back again, nodded and escorted me to a private cell. After about three hours, the guards returned and let me out of the cell. Now, that's my patrol story. I'll get to the mysterious cargo shipments when I get some beer and psychological help. See you soon. So, a couple of things have happened in between my last update. First, I can confirm that I really didn't shoot my wife during my patrol last night, thank God. And that my post has changed. So the sergeant came up to me today and said, Hey Jason, I heard about last night and I was impressed how you handled the situation. Most people wouldn't have made it back. 
Thank you, I said. Well, don't worry about it, he responded. But I have a new job for you tonight. I need you to handle delivery security tonight. Um, okay, sir, I think I can handle it. <laughs> don't worry, Jason. Heinrich's back and Carl is recovered, so they'll be joining you too. You start at 6.50pm and finish at 5.15am. Have a good one. Good one, yeah, right. I thought as I got ready for my shaft. The delivery section of the base was big. Four trucks could fit in it and there would still be room to spare. I saw Heinrich walk up to me. Guten Tag, Jason, he said. Oh, hey, Heinrich, I responded. How's the family? Good, good, but my son has a fever. Ready to start, Jason, he asked. Yeah, I am, I responded. But where's Carl? Oh, he's at his post. But you need to hurry. Your shift starts in five minutes. I thanked him and noticed a note pinned to a wall that said, Delivery positions. Heinrich, rations. North entrance. Carl, medical supplies. Northwest entrance. Jason, mechanical supplies. Northeast entrance. So, I need to head to the northeast entrance, I thought, as I walked towards my post. I was still thinking about last night when I bumped into a door. My position was etched in bold on a brass plate on the door. Well, here I am, I thought, and then I turned the doorknob. It was unlocked. The room was cooler than it was outside, and it had a lever on the back wall, and a console with screens on the left. And in the very center, there is an item that made my blood run cold. It was a note with instructions on it. Cursing my bad fortune, I gingerly picked the note up. Here's what it said. Hello, guardsman. This note is to prepare you for your following shift at this post. Please read these instructions carefully and follow them to a T. Or very unfortunate things will happen to you. Rule number one. You only have mechanical supplies coming through here. If you see any truck marked otherwise, direct them to the appropriate entrance. Rule number two. Our trucks have the base logo on the side of them, which is a white octagon with the Omega symbol inside. If you see trucks without said logo, alert security. Rule number three. Lock the door at all times. Rule number four. Between 11.50 and 12.30, do not exit the room. No truck should come through at this time, giving you no reason to go out. Rule number five. Your squad mates have their own jobs to do. So if you hear knocking on your hopefully locked door, and hear your squad mates asking you to open up, ignore them. Rule number six. Howling from the woods is natural. Screaming and or crying is not. If you hear the latter, get the mini Uzi from the drawer and pray that the door holds. Rule number seven. If you see anyone at the entrance, use the intercom to direct them to the civilian entrance. If they have no face, pull the lever at the back of the wall, which will close the gates and contact security. Rule number eight. If you're inspecting a truck and hear a music box playing, order the driver to open the back and shoot anything inside. Remember, you have machine parts and supplies. Nothing should be moving. Rule number nine. You will see a young woman in the room. She will give you useful items like extra magazines or spare batteries. Take what you need. But for the love of all things holy, don't say no. Rule number 10. This almost never happens, but if you see a red truck coming off the road, immediately close the gates and pray you hear the truck skid off the road. Or else the cleaning crew will need to use a mop on you. This is not a prank nor a joke. And we are not responsible for whatever happens if you decide not to listen. Sincerely, base security. Oh great, this again. I thought while I pondered why I had agreed to this. Well, too late to back out. It's getting late and I need to start. Locking the door, I wave the first few trucks in. The first few hours are not eventful with only a handful of trucks going to the wrong place, but I redirected them to either Heinrich's or Carl's post. But then I noticed a truck that had no visible symbol. 
Number two, our trucks have the base logo on the side of them, which is a white octagon with the Omega symbol inside. If you see trucks without said logo, alert security. Come in, base security. I nearly yelled into the radio. There's a truck bearing no logo at the northeast entrance. Could you send someone to deal with the situation? Roger that, someone's on their way. The voice responded. About two minutes later, a guy in body armor tapped on my window and told me to look away. And then made some loud noises and then cursing broke out. When I turned around, the truck and the guy were gone. Confused, I continued on. It was now 11.50 and no trucks had come in. So I radioed Heinrich to ask how stuff was going along. Heinrich? Come in, Heinrich, I said. Oh, hello, Jason. Heinrich's cheerful voice filled the room. Hey, Heinrich, how are things going on your end? I asked. Oh, not much. Some drivers came from your gate, I believe. I could barely contain my laughter. Those idiots, I said. I got three of yours and two of Carl's. Speaking of, have you heard from Carl at all? No, I haven't, Heinrich said. But I'm sure you can handle them. It was here that I was interrupted by the loudest scream that I had ever heard. It sounded like the depths of hell were opening up on the other side of the door. Jason, what's happening? Heinrich yelled out and I couldn't answer. Every regret of my life was running through my mind and then... Zen. Oh, I'm fine, Heinrich. I looked at the time. It was at 12.30. Number 4. Between 11.50 and 12.30, do not exit the room. No truck should come through at this time, giving you no reason to go out. So, that's why I thought as I waved the next truck through. I can't believe I just noticed, but Site Omega is wag. So I finished the last few trucks. Luckily, without the music box, and was about to wrap up when I saw something on the camera. It was a red truck. Oh, heck no. Number 10. This almost never happens, but if you see a red truck coming off the road, immediately close the gates and pray you hear the truck as get off the road, or else the cleaning crew will need to use a mop on you. I dove for the lever and nearly pulled it out. The truck was just a mile away, but the gate was closing so slowly. I prayed that my death would be swift. But at the last minute, I heard something swerve off the road and slam into the wall. Oh, thank God. Heinrich, check in. Carl, come in, I said. Here, said Heinrich. Here, said Carl. Okay, I need a nap. I'll see you guys after I've found more beer than last time and more psychological help. So, I'm back at it again and in the hospital, treating some wounds after what happened tonight. If you're getting confused, I don't blame you, so let's get started. So, I was in my quarters recovering from my patrol and nightmarish delivery guard duty when a note was passed under my door. Here's what it said. Attention. It has come to the knowledge of the high command that a known organization called Warrior Liberty Front, not to be confused with Washington Liberation Front, has been targeting military bases all over the country. As such, command has ordered all soldiers with three years of experience in the base to meet in the mess hall, no exceptions, so guard roles can be distributed. Sincerely, Head of Security. Three years of experience, uh, I guess that's me, I thought, still recovering from the past two days. When I got to the mess hall, I saw Heinrich, Carl, and a few others that I didn't recognize. Hey guys, did you see the note? I asked them. Yeah, I saw it, but I don't know what post I'm going to be assigned to. I wonder what- All right, you idiots. The high commander suddenly yelled out. I put your rolls up on the wall. Now do your duties unless you're too dumb to even read. And with that, he left and slammed the door shut. Still in shock, I said to Heinrich. Well, there's your answer. And I went to view the paper. Guard pose. Hans, base perimeter. Fritz, Charles, Robert, and Carl. Watchtowers. Heinrich, server rooms. Jason, archival room. Failure to appear at your post will result in severe reprimands. 
Well, Pinerick, I'll see you tomorrow. I said to him before I walked off. Maybe I'll finally get some answers tonight. It took about five minutes to get down to the archival rooms, and I ran into Heinrich on the way there. Hey, where are the server rooms? He asked. Head down there and take a left. My post is here, I said. The room was big with five doors that read Security Room, National Archive, Technology Archive, Scientific Archive, and Medicine Archive. Why one base would need four archival rooms was beyond me. When I entered it, I found a monitor linked to camera systems, a Mossberg 500 shotgun in a rack with 20 boxes of ammo, an earpiece, and of course, a list of rules. Just by luck. Here's what they said. Archival room rules. If you're reading this, it means that you were picked up for the archival room guard duty. Feel free to read any documents that you wish, since they were declassified decades ago. Please follow these rules to best carry out your job. Rule number one. There will be a check in every hour. Be sure to answer. Rule number two. You need to patrol each room at least once, but if you hear growling coming from the other side of a room door, skip it and reinforce the door. Reinforcements can be found under the desk. Rule number three. By now, you would have heard of the WLF. Make sure to check the camera system every once in a while, while operatives carry equipment that jam electronic devices. If you see a camera in any room turn static, barge right on in there and shoot anything that moves. Rule number four. And between 11.40 and 1.30, only view the cameras in each room. If a camera goes static, don't worry, whatever is in there will get them. Rule number five. If you hear someone knocking on your door, say, I admit it, and they'll leave you alone. Rule number six. As stated before, read what you wish while on patrol, but please keep patrols no more than ten minutes long. Rule number seven. If you see none of your fellow squad members while you're stationed here, if you see anyone while on patrol, immediately order them to identify themselves. If they don't, shoot them. Rule number eight. If you see a little girl in a red dress on any of the cameras, shut off the camera and reinforce the room door. Rule number nine. If you hear your earpiece broadcast in an unbelievably loud sound, take it off and crush it with your foot. You will not be reprimanded, but you won't be able to tell if WLF operatives are nearby. Rule number 10. If you hear laughter coming from any room, run to the security office and reinforce the office door. Do not remove the reinforcement until the end of your shift. Note. If you manage to capture an operative, alert security and they'll come and take him or her away. You're only going to be here for one night, since extra personnel will arrive in the morning. But until then, stay safe. Okay, so I'll only be here for one night. I thought as I pondered my life choices. Well, at least I'll finally get some answers here. I decided to head into the technology archive room first, since I had mechanical parts for my delivery guard duty and I'm just curious. Well, no WLF operatives have showed up yet. But I did learn lots of interesting things like the development of the German military and many of the stuff that we use. I was about to move on when this came through the earpiece. Guardsman, this is your commander. Report in. Jason redacted here. Nothing at my end. I responded. We'll copy that, Jason. Be aware that we got reports of operatives around the perimeter and a suspected sighting in the server room one. So be alert. Yep, I got it, I said. And then I moved my way to the National Archives when I heard a growl from the other side. Number two, you need to patrol each room at least once, but if you hear growling coming from the other side of a room door, skip it and reinforce the door. And so I booked it back, and sure enough, there were door barricades under the desk. I ran back towards the National Archives, and as soon as I had finished setting up the barricade, a huge thump rang out, and I was physically pushed back, and I landed on the floor. And thank God... After noping out of the National Archives, I checked the time, and it was 
So I headed back to the office and I watched the cameras. And there was static on the camera in the scientific archive. I wasn't worried, in fact, when I heard the growling and screaming and frantic shooting. I couldn't help but smile, as those WLF operatives had met a hideous demise. At 1.36, I grabbed my Mossberg 500 and headed to the scientific archive to find any survivors. And to my disbelief, there was a female operative that had survived. But after she had both stabbed and shot me two times, I couldn't believe it. If you manage to capture a WLF operative, alert security and they'll come and take him or her away. So I searched her and found a file named Swallow Song. I couldn't make anything of it, so I decided to give it to the commander when I reported in. Come in, I said. I have a female operative in my custody, and I'm requesting pickup. Roger that, Jason. Send in a team to your position. Good work, by the way. And so I took her back, but we didn't talk much. But we stared daggers at each other until the security team came, with the commander, and took the operative away. And I also showed them the file that I had found as well. Well, okay, I'll look into it, but nice work tonight. I'll be sure to tell your sergeant about your performance. I thanked him and the rest of my shift was peaceful. Now, I'm in the medical ward to recover. I wonder if Carl went through the same situation. Hey everyone, I'm back from a busy night that was possibly the related to Operation Swallow Song. So once again, the Sarge came up to me and said, Hey, there's the guy that I wanted to see. And I said to him, Hey Sarge, did you get anything from the operative that I had captured yesterday? No, she committed uninstall life before we could question her. But we're currently debunking theories on what this all is. Is it related to the 262? Uh, possibly, but let's not jump to conclusions yet. There's still a high security risk at the moment, so I need you to guard the reactor chambers. I'm sorry, the reactor chambers? I asked in disbelief. Relax, you'll get special equipment when you get there. I'll see you tomorrow. What? No, no, no. I said to organize a... I heard him yell as he walked away. And luckily, I'm two days from retiring. I thought as I made my way down to the reactor chambers that shouldn't exist, by the way. When I got down there, there was a heavy blast door that had a note on it. Caution. The security room is the only safe place from radiation outside of this area. The security room is beyond this door. There will be an airlock attached to the room. Repeat. The chambers are extremely radioactive, and you will die if you aren't protected. Authorized personnel only. Yeah, no kidding, Sherlock. I thought as the blast door automatically opened. The security room wasn't that big. Just a monitor hooked up to a couple of cameras. A panel controlling the chamber doors. A tactical hazard suit. Yes, those are a thing. An M4 battle carbon in a case and a file of German nuclear history for some reason. A earpiece and the rules, of course. Reactor room rules. While it may seem like this post will be uneventful, trust me, that can change in a dime if allowed. And these reactors are two decades old, so you better follow these rules. Rule number one. Do not leave this room without your suit, obviously. Rule number two, take the provided carbon when out of patrol to each of the chambers. There may be unexpected guests that you may encounter. Rule number three, the chamber doors are controlled by the buttons on the panel. Rule number four, if any of the chamber doors open on their own, immediately close the door using the respective button and seal all the doors using the lever. Rule five, if WLF operatives are in the area, the cameras will show static, so go to the relevant chamber and deal with the situation. Rule number six. If you are patrolling any of the chambers and if you see the door close, immediately pull the override lever and haul bot back to the security booth. Rule number seven. If you see a flashing red light on a camera in any chamber, shut off said camera and lock all the doors, it's not a meltdown. 
Rule number eight, if you hear crying or screaming coming from any chamber, lock that chamber's door. Rule number nine, all doors are marked with radioactive. If you find a door with biohazardous material in it, skip that chamber. Radiation isn't the only thing inside. Rule number 10, we have four chambers marked one through four. If you see a fifth door, ignore it and contact base security. Rule number 11. There are no workers that are working during your shift. If you see anyone, inform security immediately and lock yourself in the office. And for the love of God, don't talk to them. They are not human. Rule number 12. Be sure to check the spent reactor power rods in each chamber. The list of spent rods will be on a list somewhere in the room. If the number of spent rods are less than the number listed, simply remove a rod, as one will definitely be spent. If it's over the number, run. Rule number 13. The most important part. If you see shadows in any of the chambers, turn off the camera before they notice. If they so much as glance at the camera, they've noticed. Note. If your suit is not at the specified location, Contact the Special Engineer Corps, and they'll resolve the issue. And if you need more details, feel free to read all the papers in the file to be more educated. Do not disregard these rules, or radiation will be the least of your concerns. Sincerely, Special Security Ops. Thank God, I have to put up with this crap for two more days. My thought as I suited up before my shaft. So, as my cancer chances increase every hour... It was time for my first round. Chamber 1 was first and it was mostly uneventful, with all the reactor rods accounted for with no extras. And the next was a more eventful, with the doors automatically closing behind me. Number 6. When you are patrolling any of the chambers, if you see the door close, immediately pull the override lever and haul butt to the security booth. I nearly lunged for the lever because I nearly forgot what to do. I pulled the lever and ran for it. After about 30 minutes, the camera in chamber 3 showed some static. Well, time to take out the trash, I thought with a smile, as I grabbed the carbon off the rack. When I entered the chamber, I found four WLF operatives trying to heist some spent reactor rods. Big mistake. I took them out without hesitation. And then I found something out about Operation Swallow Song. A WLF operative had another file in him, and this one described what the Schwalben are. The Schwalben are high-tech super soldiers apparently, and they use ammunition made from spent uranium, which has immense penetrating power. The Schwalben and the WLF are apparently a surviving Nazis group, and the plan on restoring Germany to Hitler's dream. After the cleanup crew came and cleaned up the mess, I heard crying coming from chamber 4 as I was preparing to enter. Number 8. If you hear crying or screaming coming from any chamber, lock that chamber's door. So I relocked that thing and slid a conveniently placed metal bar across the door to deadbolt it. A second later, an animalistic scream and repeated slamming came from the door, and I was glad that the blast doors were built like tanks. After another half hour, I saw some more static. So I headed to the chamber. Nothing could have prepared me for what I had found. It was two people in exosuits trying to steal some more spent rods. It's the Schwalben. Crap. Thankfully, I will give you my all suddenly came through the speaker and before I continue, I highly recommend that you listen to the song so you can get why I felt so epic at that time. The first one charged me using an extendable blade from its wrist but it missed and slammed into the wall. The second one shot at me with an LMG. Gotta remember uranium bullets, and I shot back. And then the one with the blade again charged at me and nearly got me, but I dodged out of the way and made him hit the guy with the LMG, knocking them both unconscious. And then I took both out and hit him in the head. By the time security arrived, my shift was over, and I went to debrief with the head of security. I'll post again once I've figured everything out and I get this dang suit off. 
Hey everyone, so I was assigned to a new squad tonight, and it got more intense than ever. The Sarge came up to me and said, Okay, Jason, for your last two nights, I want you on the Omega Black Squad, our elite division. I don't know much, but they'll tell you more when you get there. Good luck. So I headed underground to the facility housing, the Omega Black Squad. And once I was there, a gorgeous woman with green hair and eyes greeted me in the hallway. Hey there, Jason. She said a little too enthusiastically. I'm Selena and I need to give this to you. Okay, so where do I? I was interrupted by Selena giving me a bone crushing hug. What are you doing? Sorry, but you're really handsome and I've never seen a new person in like two years. Also, head to the break room. That's a map that I gave you. I'll see you soon. She said as she walked off. Good God. I thought as I headed to the break room. When I got there, I didn't see anyone. But there was a Chris Vector machine gun, an earpiece, and rules which I could tell were written by Selena. Initiation Instructions Hello Jason, as per usual standards, all new members must undergo an initiation in order to be formally acknowledged by Omega Black. If you tell anyone, we will deny all knowledge of you and any procedures performed. Now the job is easy. Patrol the facility and there will be people with you. These rules are to ensure your safety. Rule number one. Start a patrol every 30 minutes. Rule number two. I will be in the security office at all times. If you see me in the hallway like how I greeted you today, ignore it. Rule number three. You will see a ghostly white man in a two-piece suit with long arms. Do not show any signs of fear, and he'll leave you alone. Rule number four. If for some reason you need to enter the security room, say the code word Alpha and I'll let you in. Otherwise, I'll shoot you. Rule number five. The three members that will be with you are Fritz, Charles, and Hans. We do not have a member with the name Kruger. If Kruger is spotted, run to the break room and lock the door. Rule number six. There will be a skeleton crew of workers in the labs and on janitorial duty. You are encouraged to talk to the janitorial staff, but don't disrupt the lab workers. Rule number seven. If you're patrolling and hear a female scream, haul it back to the break room and remain there for the rest of the night. Rule number eight. If you need to round a corner or enter a room, but you don't know what's waiting for you, Ask me to check since I can see you on the cameras. Rule number nine. You can trust the janitors. They'll provide you with advice and warnings. Just be respectful and don't knock down the wet floor signs. Rule number 10. You'll get a Chris Factor SMG, but never shoot anything that hasn't engaged you first. Rule number 11. If you hear the elevator stop on this floor, Enter and make sure that there's no blood in it. If there is, continue on your patrol, but say a prayer every five minutes. The type of deity doesn't matter, but make sure you say it in a clear and understandable voice. And finally, if you ever feel the need to chat, I'm always open to conversation. Sincerely, Selena. So, what do you say? I said a voice behind me and I nearly fell over. It was three heavily armored people with Chris Vectors as well. Oh, okay, I'm ready, I said in response. Great, your round starts soon, don't be late. Fritz, I think, said. Don't worry, I'll be with you, it's a two-man job. So after around 20 minutes of waiting, Fritz and I started our first round. It was mostly uneventful with Selena guiding us from the security room. The next round was more intense. The slender man in the two-piece suit appeared in the hallway when I was minding my own business. When I turned around, there he was. 3. You will see a ghostly white man in a two-piece suit with long arms. Do not show any signs of fear and he'll leave you alone. I was terrified. It had no face and no hands, but I was determined not to show it. After what was far too long, he simply vanished. Jason, Jason, can you hear me? Selena yelled into my earpiece. I saw the Slender Man on the camera. Are you okay? I'm good, I replied. Except I may have wet my pants a little bit. Thank God. 
Fritz reported you missing five minutes ago. Head back to the break room. He's waiting. After I apologized to Fritz for delaying the check-in, I went back on patrol. I was getting curious, so I said to Selena, uh, How long have you been on Omega Black? About three years, and as I said, You're the most handsome person I've ever met, she said. Ahem, Fred suddenly blurted out. Charles and Hans were bent double with laughter. If you two lovebirds have finished flirting with each other, then do your freaking jobs. Oh, uh, okay. You could practically hear the embarrassment in her voice. After trying to bleach that event from my memory, unsuccessfully by the way, I finally got some answers. I found a file named Cerebral Cortex Interface System, which to quote, allows the user to transfer his or her thoughts and memories onto a computer system, but the user will be dead. There is a sheet of paper attached to the file that said this. This classified document details the steps to transfer one's a conscious onto a computer system. Pros. Disabled can be free. People near death can be saved. People transferred into the system can control the base systems as efficiently as a human brain. The subject can talk to whoever was controlling it. The cons. The subject dies after transfer. The subject can transfer between systems. Can jump from a PC to a laptop. The subject must be mentally stable. The subject can be corrupted by computer viruses. To God, I thought, this can't be real, right? After about two hours, my shift was over and I debriefed. I'll update you all soon. System Online Location, Site Omega, The Black Forest, Germany Date, 7-21-20 Time, 16-30 Begin Transmission Hello, I've changed, and if you have questions, well... Let's just say that I have no mortal boundaries anymore. After my last post, everything went wrong. I followed the rules and yet everything was wrong. Allow me to start from the beginning. It was the day after my last post and I had one more job left, which was to guard the redacted test labs as part of my former duty as a member of Omega Black. Now, what was in the labs? It's censored, redacted, data expunged, and the cerebral cortex interface system. When I entered the lab, a note written by Selena was on the security desk. Hey Jason, for your final night, we ask you to guard the redacted testing labs. You just need to make sure that the WLF, yes I heard, don't make it in. Just stay safe and you can ask me out when you're done. Sincerely, Selena. After I'd read the note, I started my usual patrol route. The rules hadn't changed from last time. Thirty minutes had passed when I saw a WLF operative attempting to enter lab number one. I dealt with him with minimal issues and went on as usual. Then, at around 11.50, I felt a sharp pain in the base of my head and I passed out. Get your butt up, said a voice in front of me. I didn't capture you for you to just sleep around. What the heck are... I began, and then I saw the WF logo on his sleeve. Who I am is not important, he said. What is important is your information on the inner workings of this base. You killed seven of my operatives, seven, and that means you have many things stored in that head of yours, and I need them. I'm not telling you anything, I said, and I'm definitely not telling you what's in there. Hey, Jason, what's going on? Fritz suddenly appeared behind my captor. Fritz, shoot him! I yelled before I bolted away. I could hear Fritz unloading at my captor and his forces, but I didn't escape unharmed. A spray of bullets at my side and one punctured an artery. Ah, dang it! I said through gritted teeth. And then suddenly the slender man appeared in front of me. Luckily for me, I wasn't afraid of him, but the same couldn't be said for my pursuers. What the heck? One of them sputtered out. As I ran away, I could hear them shooting and getting ripped to shreds behind me. And then two more showed up in the hallway to the left. One of these super soldiers yelled at me. 
As I approached the cerebral cortex interface system, a bullet hit me in the lung and I fell over. Duh, I swore. Now the interface system was the only thing that could save me now. As I prepared myself for the transfer, a voice ran out from the other side of the door. In there, get the freaking door open. I hurried with the preparations as the voice said. Set the breaching charges. We need to get this door open. I pressed the button and everything went black. I saw as these security forces dealt with the WLF. I saw as they found my body. I saw as Selena cried her eyes out. I saw as they buried me with the Iron Cross. Now I shall control these systems and this base shall become great. For I am no longer Jason Redacted. I am Rasputin, the Kriegs Machine. End transmission. Time, 2330. System status, standby mode. The tall, skinny man approached with slow steps. My friends and I could barely hold our laughter. That's a funny way of dressing, mister. Are you at the circus in town? Do you know any magic tricks? Eddie said, snorting. He liked joking around a lot. The man's uncanny appearance made him look like one of those people who sell you fake lottery tickets or revolutionary air conditioners that you could fit in your pocket. He wore a double-breasted black and red pinstripe suit with a black satin tie. His smile looked deceiving and his eyes held thousands of secrets. He had a fancy old walking cane with a golden lion head as a handle. The gravel crushed under his black leather shoes. His black top hat absorbed the sunlight, adding even more to his mysterious aura. Hi there, kids. Well, you are right, young Edward. You are very right. I used to work for a circus a long time ago, but now I decided to venture into a solo business. The man said in a low-pitched voice. Please, allow me to introduce myself. Name's Edgar Verlis. At your service. The odd man said. He took a bow before us in slow motion. The tune of his creaking bones made me uneasy. How do you know my name? Eddie said, rising from his sitting position. At that point, I felt a tingling sensation crawl up my spine. We glanced at each other as tension built up in the air. Whoa there, easy now, and don't be afraid. I am a magician after all. That's how I know your names. And what I also know is that magic is real. Would you like to see a trick? Yes, I do. Can you magically make a bunny appear? Cassandra said, clapping her hands. Oh, aren't you a bunch of lovely kids? Edgar said, mimicking Cassandra's gesture. I have something even better than a bunny, Cassandra. How about 100 for each of you if you let me give you a tour of my haunted house? What do you say? Well, now you're talking, Mr. Verlis, said Vince. He snorted and spat on the ground. You have a haunted house. Is it a rigged one or the real deal? I'll let you kids decide. All you have to do is stay inside for one night. If you all get out, you'll get 1,000 each. I think you can imagine that it will not be an easy task, and there will be a lot of hard challenges that you must pass, Verlis said, producing a large silver key from his right side pocket. I mean, all that money could do us good, guys, I said while looking after the key that he waved around in the cool autumn air. Indeed, it could help you buy that console that you've always wanted, Henry, plus some extra games, right? Besides, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. My house isn't open to the public, and admission is by invitation only. I moved it around the country all year trying to find the bravest children. I'm hoping I'm not wrong when I say that you are brave, yes. The thin man said, now holding the key before my eyes. 
The way that he said all of our names felt very unsettling. Something about this man made me uncomfortable, but it felt like a kick in our pride if we had said no to his challenge. Of course, you're not wrong. We aren't afraid of anything, said Emma, putting her phone in her back pocket. I didn't expect less of you, brave young kids. Can I say, Emma, that I love how you dyed your hair? All those rainbow colors look stunning, Verla said, grinning. That felt awkward and cringy. Thanks, I guess, she replied. Can I ask, how do you move your house around the country? Seems a difficult process to do that, said David, flicking a cigarette butt. Stop littering, David, cried Emma, picking up the butt and handing it back to him. Sorry, I forget sometimes. Lucky me that you're the voice of reason. He replied, rolling his eyes ironically. Can we go home now? I don't like this guy. Screw his money. Come on, dude. It's going to be fun. Emma replied. David puffed, rolling his eyes again. To answer your question, David, the house floats around the country. I move it around using magic and it can appear wherever I want it to. I call it the floating house. Its residents always like it when they see a new place, such as your beautiful little town, Vertha said. I swear this is the most awkward advertisement pitch if I've ever heard one, said Eddie, irritated. You expect us to believe you. Smells like BS to me, and guess what? No matter how much gold you put on it, it still smells. Verla said that he didn't expect us to believe him. He still handed us the $100 bills and told us to be at the clearing in the woods at midnight sharp. That's where the house will be. I'm sure you know there was nothing there until a few days ago. If you see the house, you will know I mean business. After all, you kids are brave and like challenges. It's all fun and games and you get to win a lot of money. Verla said as he handed me the key. He told me to take it and use it to open the front door. And then he told us that inside, we would find a list of strict rules that we had to follow during our stay in the house. Under no circumstances would we deviate from them. And you expect one or some of us would be stupid enough and break the rules, and then we would fail the challenge. I've seen many movies and read many books and I know that you're safe if you follow the rules. If not, then you're dead meat, said Vince, checking to see if the $100 bill was real. Seems legit. All right, children. I think you have had enough of me for now. How about seeing each other at the end of this haunted house adventure? I'll be waiting for you with open arms and $1,000 each. Verlis exclaimed, rubbing his hands together. Can you show us a bit of magic so we know that you're not a fraud? Inquired David, calm and collected as a sniper on the battlefield. Why, of course I can, David. How about you think of a number between 1 and 10,000? You can even whisper it to some of your friends here before I say it. Verla said, turning his back. Let me know when you're ready, Dave. I'll even cover my ears. David gathered everybody in a circle and we sat as if in a rugby scrum. All right, boys and girls, let's send this idiot home. I'm thinking of the number 7,256. It's as random as I can make it. He can't guess it, right? He whispered. Yeah, not a chance, man, Vince replied. We broke the circle and David told Verlis that he had picked a number. All right, young man, your face looks full of determination and discipline, and I'm sure you think you made this a hard guess for me, but I can assure you that that is not the case, as I always get these things right. Call me a mind reader, call me a magician, and call me the devil or just a lucky man, but I know that your number is 7,256. Verlis said and that poisonous grin appeared on his face again. How the... David didn't get to finish his sentence. He stood there frozen in disbelief. Your favorite food is pizza and your favorite color is blue. 
Three years ago, you got stung by a bee and almost died from shock. Luckily, you got administered a shot and Dr. Meadows saved your life. Cassandra, your grandfather, built this town and made it flourish and become the diamond it is today. I could go on forever talking about everything, but you might just get bored. I could show you a card trick, make pigeons appear from thin air, and I could change the weather. You think of a thing that seems impossible and I can do it. Vertha said, rolling his eyes. I felt all blood drain from my face in the air bore a grave-like silence. The more that I looked at him talking, the dizzier that I got. The whole world spun around me, and I prayed for the moment when he would go away and he would leave us alone. Yet I felt like we had no choice but to do what he said. In a way, we felt his enormous power even though he only used a fraction of it to control our minds, answers, and decisions. His hypnotic stare, the way that he articulated some words, and how he persuaded us to go and take a tour of his haunted house spoke volumes about how vicious he was. I felt in the depths of my soul that he was much more than the eye met. He waved goodbye and told us to arrive on time, which meant not a second later than midnight. We all watched him getting smaller and smaller until he finally went out of view on the winding roads. Did you guys feel it too? The way that he made us listen to every word he said. Dang it, now I have a huge headache, David said, massaging his temples. Yeah, it's like he held us captive in some invisible shackles and he played with our minds, Emma said, her hands shaking uncontrollably. I'm scared, guys. I'm terrified to go into that place. I am too, but I don't think we have a choice now, do we? We took his money, or better said, he made us take his money. And now we have to play his game. I can't imagine what it'll do to us if we don't hold up our end of the deal, said Cassandra. Yeah, dang it, it looks like we have no other choice than to go. I said, biting my nails as I felt my heart falling into the claws of absolute dread. We didn't say much on our way home. Maybe it was out of fear. Maybe Verlis did something to our minds. His infectious grin poisoned the back of my head. It plastered itself there like growing cancer, ever expanding and corrupting everything in its wake. The hours passed and midnight came closer. We all snuck out and met at the last tree before the wood started. The silence of the night felt heavy on our shoulders. I didn't know what to expect when we got there, knowing that it was too late to back down. I told everybody not to fear anything and to be brave. I thought of Verlis's words, saying that he needed brave kids for this challenge. Maybe those words had a secret meaning behind them. The trees loomed over us, offering us safe passage and shielding us from the beasts that haunt our world during nights like this. An owl hooted in the distance, and a swarm of crows cawed as they flew from the trees. Maybe they warned us that it was not too late and that we should go back. Dang it, we should have hired a TV crew to follow us around. This adventure has all the ingredients to become a series or a movie. I mean, it's perfectly laid out in front of us. Vince said, checking his phone. We still have 20 minutes left and should see the clearing quickly. Well, there's a lot more until the adventure ends. It hasn't even begun, Vince. I'm curious about what the house looks like, Cassandra said, imitating a ghost. We all chuckled and continued walking through the night's deep and dark vastness, greeted by a dense fog that smelled like petrichor and sweet rose jam. We set eyes on Verlis's old and diseased house. In the house, old and creaky, stood approximately two feet above the ground, floating as if controlled by an invisible and evil force. It creaked from all its joints, nooks, and crannies, the windows dimly illuminated by sick yellow lights. They seemed to grow in intensity as we approached the ancient wooden building. 
It swayed to and fro as gently as a feather carried away by gusts of wind. We felt its magnificent force, our hearts getting heavier by the minute. A maelstrom of fear and insecurity took shape inside my mind, twisting and turning endlessly and taking away whatever courage that I had left. We're going in to die, David said dramatically. I didn't know if he meant to say that out loud. It felt more like a monologue. Uh, sorry about that. I don't know what's gotten into me. He glanced at me, his eyes shining with terror and disgust. Yet we all knew that we couldn't go back. The money that Verlis gave us meant that we had a binding contract with him. Who knew what this peculiar man's actions would be if we had turned back and walked away? Do you guys feel it too? Cassandra asked, placing the right hand over her heart. This house, it senses that we're here. It feeds on our fear. I can feel my heart beating faster than it ever had. A black fog enveloped the house and a loud metallic noise made our bodies tremble. I twisted the key in the lock and a melody introduced us to our unforgettable adventure. We hurried inside as if pushed by the dark clouds above our heads. The air outside as smelled like a storm would soon arrive and we would be safer inside the house, or so the house wanted us to believe. Inside, a giant chandelier hung from the ceiling and dimly illuminated the old walls, a sickly pale and feverish yellow hue that hurt her eyes, while flickering and buzzing as if sending a secret Morse code messages. Wood cracked in the fireplace and as such it sent shadows on the walls that danced like black little and deceiving devils. Jasmine, lemon, and chamomile fragrances spread throughout the ancient mansion. It reminded me of the tea my grandmother made in childhood whenever I had a cold. It smells beautiful in here. All these paintings, the mahogany furniture, and the grand chandelier are mesmerizing. This for this guy has great taste, Emma exclaimed, her eyes filled with wonder. I gotta admit it myself, this place looks like it was taken right out of a book, said Vance. He looked at the long dark corridor at his left where a door creaked. Did you guys hear that? We all nodded as a rising tension made our shrinking hearts beat faster. Wasn't there supposed to be a list of rules here? Asked Cassandra. Silence settled all around us as the door creaked again. We glanced at it and saw that it had opened. The corridor seemed even longer now. With bated breath, we moved toward that door. I suppose we'll find it in there, said David, pointing at the half-open door. Moving towards the door, passing small windows to our left and even smaller paintings to the wall on our right, I thought about how we had ended up in this situation. Have we chosen to come here or did Verlis persuade us to and as such, satisfy his hunger for whatever game he wanted to play here? Vince opened the door and saw a skeletal figure pointing at us. A demented evil laugh filled every inch of the house. Fear crawled up my spine and Emma screamed and hugged Cassandra. David froze in place while Eddie's face went pale all of a sudden, his blood all but draining from it. Vince had been the only one who didn't even flinch. Ah, screw this old guy and his stupid antics, Vince said, flipping the lights on. I ain't scared of your stuff for less. Was everyone good? One of the skeletons used in biology classes stood before us, his plastic bones all yellowed with age. He held a red crumpled paper in his right hand while his left pointed at us as if telling us to take it. I'm okay, even though I almost had a heart attack, said Emma, panting. Guess we found his BS list of rules here. I'll take it, I said. I grabbed the red paper and unwrapped it and read it out loud for all my friends to hear. Welcome to the floating house, 
I very much hope that you enjoy your stay with us. Please read the rules of this house. If you follow them accordingly, you will get to the end of your adventure safe and sound. Even better, you'll each win $1,000. 1. If you see the red door and hear knocks from the other side, do not open it. 2. If you meet a bald, big, strange fellow with an orange beard who wants to offer you gold coins, you must be careful. He seems peaceful, but that could not be further from the truth. He will tell you a riddle, and if you do not know the answer, he'll pluck all your fingernails and eat them. 3. If you encounter a black door with a golden knob, you must all knock on it. When it opens, you have to go in and stay inside the pitch black darkness for just one minute. Once the alarm rings, you'll find yourselves back where you last were. 4. Room 33 is where you can rest for a few moments. This is the safe room. You will not be harmed in here. The lady in red playing the violin will help you regain your strength and heal any wounds that you might have. Listen to her full song. 5. Do not touch the Harlequin dolls in the circus room. If you do, they will come to life and laugh into your ears until your head explodes. 6. You will arrive in the room with clocks. There is a silver key there which you can buy from the clockmaster with coins from Redbeard. If you do not have said coins, you must offer him a personal thing. Personal as in a strand of hair, a finger, an eye, your tongue. You get the idea. You will need the key to unlock the exit door. 7. Beware of the uninvited guest. There will be a person who will join the group and you will not even realize it. I don't even know who they are. I mean, this is my house too. They've been here for 250 years and I can't find them. If you see them and manage to trap them, I will ensure your reward is a thing out of this world. 8. If you find a harmonica, you need to play it. The musical notes will lead you to the golden door, which holds secrets that will change your life forever. This never happened to anyone in the history of this house. So it's almost impossible to happen to you, but I had to tell you this. 9. A woman made of spiders roams the halls of this house. If you see her, do not engage. Walk past her, do not make contact. If she smells your fear, it's already too late. So do not be afraid if you see her, or you will die. 10. The room with crystals appears at random. Inside, you will find a piece of paper with the last rule of this game. You must follow the rules only if they apply to the situation. Some of the rules stated in this list might not happen. Last but not least, I wish you all good luck. I will be waiting for you at the end of this journey. I expect you all to live and stay, let's say, intact. Good luck. Yours truly, Edgar Verlis. Yeah, screw this, said Vince. These rules seem kind of friendly, which is totally BS. We all know how Verlis is because we saw him. He has that devilish grin. Do you guys remember when he almost took control of our minds? Remember when we looked into his eyes and saw that behind those pupils was a deep black, infinite void ready to consume everything in its wake. Yeah, I saw it, but I don't think we could have done anything about it. I don't think it was even our decision to be here. He wanted us to play, so he got us to play this stupid game. We must gather our marbles, stay safe, and focus on getting out of here alive. The most important thing is to stay together and not lose sight of one another. I replied. Verlis might as well have been the devil himself. He might have been a long-forgotten god who returned triumphantly to Earth to wreak havoc and destroy humanity. I didn't know what or who the heck he was. All I know was that he wasn't from this place. He had great powers and knew many secrets, and he could twist your mind into doing his bidding. 
better to listen to him than to die. Or worse. By God, we had to get out of this cursed house. The long corridors, the ugly chandeliers, the screechy sounds, and the grotesque paintings of deformed people who looked at us with prying and hateful eyes made my stomach twist into knots. Dolls creeped me the heck out. Ugh. Cassandra screamed out of nowhere. They give me the heebie-jeebies. It's alright, Cass. We won't touch them if we see them, David said. Hey guys, you know that I love you alright. We need to be extra careful in this house because nothing is what it seems. Let's just play the game by Verlis's rules. I'll read them a lot again and whenever we have doubts, we just pull the paper out and reread them just to make sure. Aight, Vince said. We nodded and listened to each rule again. You take it, Henry, Vince said, handing me the paper. Oh, now what? asked Eddie. That's a good question, I replied. As far as this game went, we were inside the house, we had the rules, but we had no idea what we needed to do. We inspected the surroundings for anything that might have been useful to our little horror adventure. An adventure that could claim our very lives. Maybe that house needed sustenance and only ate children and their souls and brains, and we would be trapped there forever like ghosts without purpose. What are we supposed to do, Verlis? David cried. You think this is fun, don't you? You like scaring children, huh? Whoa, easy, Dave. Take it easy, man. It's gonna be alright. If we follow the rules, we'll survive this place, Eddie said. Stop it, please, Emma whispered. Maybe this is what he wants. Maybe he wants us to stress out and be afraid so that we'll mess up. That's a good point, I concurred. Let's calm down, people. I said. I looked everybody dead in the eye, trying to assure them mentally that it would all be okay, even though I was scared out of my wits. The floating house tour begins now. Thank you for being here. A voice said from these speakers above the large stairs that led to the first floor. A big letter X came alive right under those speakers. Max marks the spot right, Cassandra said. Let's all go there. When we climbed the stairs and saw the red door, a collective gasp escaped our mouths and we became statues frozen in time and place. A violent series of knocks and aggressive poundings came from the other side of the door, and words soon followed. But let us out, please. He's not who he says he is. A cacophony of young voices cried. Wait, don't say anything, I whispered. The first rule didn't say anything about voices, did it? I pulled the paper out just to make sure. I nodded to reinforce the last sentence. Now nah, let's ignore it and move on. Maybe whatever's on the other side, it might kill or drive us insane. Let's stay focused on the task at hand, Vince said. Screw what's on the other side, I don't care. Please, we know things. We stood where you stand. We were once children too, like you. Now we can't leave this place. Henry. They said again, a choir of ghostly voices calling my name. I felt my legs turn into concrete. Henry, don't let him get in your head, man. David said, squeezing my shoulder. Open the door, Henry. I miss you, son. I miss you so much. It's cold and dark here. Please, we can be together again. A wave of emotion washed over me as I heard my dead father's voice. He had passed away three years ago, and I remembered his smile immediately. Thousands of memories went through my mind like strips of film in an old and dusty cinema theater. My whole world came crashing down inside and around me as I wanted this to be true but I knew that it wasn't. Verlis and his disgusting house liked to feed on pain. He gave me the best advice. Son, always trust your gut. If something's too good to be true, it's probably not. I knew that the house wanted to play tricks on me. It made me hear and remember the person that I missed the most. Even though a tidal wave of sadness washed over me, I kept my composure strong and 
didn't buy the house's twisted plan for us. I sighed and swallowed the bitter sorrow I felt at that moment. The only sure thing was that my dad had been gone for a few years, buried six feet under, and probably was only bones now. I wiped the tears from my face and didn't say a word. I passed the door and motioned everyone to follow me. When I looked back, the door had vanished. Uh, sorry guys, I need a minute or two. This felt so real. Verlis, he likes to feed on our sadness and fear, huh? I sighed. Uh, we need to get out of here fast. I sat on the floor and thought about the whole situation for a moment. Why us? I mean, why did he target us? Had he felt a strong connection between all of us? Doesn't he like a true friendship? I kept staring down the long corridor of the first floor. It seemed to be infinite, stretching into nothingness. The silence that surrounded us was grave-like. It was as if tiny evil monsters lurked in the shadows or behind furniture, waiting to see what plan we had devised or if we would go completely and utterly insane. On the left side of the door, a light bulb came to life. Its dim pale bluish hue illuminated an ordinary door. But that wasn't all. On the floor right in front of the door was a small box with a harlequin head drawn on it. A small handle on one side began slowly rotating and a creepy tune began playing. A jack in the box. Um, I absolutely hate that song. My brother used to stand at my door in the middle of the night humming that song. I always thought that the devil came to my door, right until he told me that he just liked messing with me. What a prick, right? David said. He clenched his fists and beads of sweat rolled down his temples. For a moment, he found himself gritting his teeth like he was five years old again, hiding under the blanket from whatever was outside of his room. Yeah, that sucks. That stays with you even after you know the truth. Vince replied. The music stopped and a harlequin hat popped up from the box. It extended his right hand with its index finger pointing to the door. I'm pretty sure Verlis wants us to have a mini heart attack as we progress this thing. Emma said as she looked at the creepy thing. Not kill us, but scare us whenever he gets the chance. I guess so, huh? He's been doing that since we met him. Cassandra replied. Also, he messed with Henry's mind. Now look at Dave. He's as white as chalk dust. I think that he may have something ready for everyone. We must remind ourselves that whenever something here personally targets us, it's not personal. It's just something Verlis is doing to feed his twisted sense of humor, or maybe to feed on our fear, Vince said. A collective, mm-hmm, broke out, followed by everyone nodding their heads. The door opened as the jack-in-the-box caught on fire and exploded into fireworks. Colors floated in the air like fireflies. They seemed to have no direction until letters took form saying, Enter. A large room filled with porcelain dolls, plushies, life-sized clown puppets, and harlequins greeted us. They all looked at us like we were intruders. At the other end of the room, there is another door with a neon exit sign above. What's the rule saying, boss? Vince said. Rule number five. Do not touch the Harlequin dolls in the circus room. If you do, they will come to life and laugh into your ears until your head explodes. Right. So, screw the Harlequins, we can touch the bears, puppies, clowns, and the creepy porcelain dolls that look like they could eat my heart in under a second, right? Vince laughed nervously. Right? Who the heck knows anymore? Let's head for the exit and keep our eyes open and ears sharp. Dave and I will lead. Cass and Emma, you stay in the middle, then Vince with Eddie at the back. Sounds cool, I said. I feel like we're being watched big time. Emotions were high and fear was the same, but we all looked at each other and nodded in approval. Steady, let's roll. Slowly, 
then said, A slow creaking sound behind us. What was that? Betty said. Cassandra was the first to turn around and see a three foot tall mechanical harlequin standing right behind us. The heck is that? Vince asked. Um, a harlequin, Cassandra replied. Not the time, Cass, I replied. Like the door, that thing came out of nowhere with a huge grin plastered on its face and big eyes that rotated to and fro. Uh, I'm starting to feel dizzy, David said. That thing is staring right at me. Run for the exit now, Vince exclaimed. Don't look back. Go. All around us, the doll's gaze fixated on us. An ungodly number of harlequins popped up out of nowhere. The one behind us began walking like a robot, trying to catch all or just one of us. For half a second, I glanced back, afraid that the thing might hypnotize me. I only saw its opened mouth with two sets of long, sharp teeth. It squinted its eyes in anger, seemingly hungry and unwilling to waste one more second. All the harlequins came to life and some even had lights in their eyes. After running tirelessly for what seemed an eternity, a creepy nursery rhyme came to life right when we had reached the door. It was a twisted version of Pop Goes the Weasel tailored for us and the situation. All around the circus room, the children screamed in horror, ready to be tortured and consumed. Pop, go the children. The Harlequin is hungry now. It wants to eat your flesh and soul. Don't breathe, don't blink or else you'll die. Pop, go the children. The song came from inside of the Harlequin. I think Verlis had placed a tape there because it sounded pre-recorded. The Harlequin let out a demonic laugh and the song played again. This time it slowed midway. The Harlequin stopped as if it had batteries that just went dead. Done. Let's go, David said. Let's get out of here. David had managed to open the door at last. It all ended with the same song. We all went through and the door closed. In the red paint, the words, Are you scared yet? dripped on the door. That was a close call. I thought that I'd have nightmares about that Harlequin's face for years to come. I need my inhaler. This is too much, Emma said. It's okay, Em. Take your time. There's no way that I'll let anything happen to you. I swear on my mother's life. I'll die before something bad happens to you, Finn said. Thanks, Vince. You're my hero. Emma replied and proceeded to high-five Vince. Right I am, he assured her. Another close call. Wait, where are we now? This is like the opposite of the luxurious yet creepy main entrance. Cassandra said. We all turned and looked around. The wallpapers on the walls had peeled off from the passing of time and cockroaches roamed free in all directions. Broken chairs, a dusty table, and a moldy sofa lay scattered as if an angry person had violently thrown them around. Cobwebs spread out through the room like a virus and an occasional fly got stuck in the sticky threads. The air smelled like dead animals on the side of the road on a hot summer day. A rat gave its last breath in the far corner of the room. One last twitch of the leg and it was gone dead as disco. But there looked something in the shadows. A wheezing sound came from the dark. A thin sickly arm extended to grab the rat under the moonlight from a broken window on the far right end of the room. The skin was colored a dark and sickly green, with gangrenous black spots. The black nails on the long thin fingers almost fell off from the rotten flesh. Swiftly, it pulled the rat back into the darkness. I could hear how the animal's bones broke and the flesh tore apart. Whatever body that hand was attached to, it was ravenous. We all gagged at the sound of slurping and chewing. The chomping came to a halt. Don't move an inch, I whispered. I think I know what this is, Emma whispered. 
Two small red lights blinked in the darkness, and they moved forward slowly and steady. Tiny spiders came forward. Crap, the woman made of spiders. It's like we don't have time to catch our breath, said Vince. Alright, don't be scared. If I remember correctly, it says to walk right past her. He turned back to look at me and I nodded. A woman covered in a dark green goo stepped out in the moonlight. Spiders crawled on her, getting into her mouth, nose, and ears. She wanted to speak, but only a soft wheezing came out. I couldn't understand any of the words. Wam, wam, she said, her cracked lips barely touching each other. Behind two small spider webs, her red eyes glistened, illuminating the whole room. Spiders burst her lip open and came out in big numbers. The few strands of her hair on her head resembled strings of decaying cotton. What is she trying to say? Cassandra asked. Is she going to move? Wait, look behind her. There's a door, Eddie said. The number 33 was written on a small black patch with gold foil stamping. My children, the woman said out of nowhere. You are my children. The spiders came out of her mouth and rivers, splashing on the rotten floor like a waterfall. The green, red, purple, blue, and black spiders came toward us with flashing speed. Stay put, don't get scared, please. Vince screamed. Walk through them and past the old hag. Let's get to safety. We're all tired and could use a minute's rest, David said. The spiders marched forward as if going to war with humankind. We all began ambling, crunching them under our sneakers. The woman slowly turned her head as we walked past her. Smack them if they crawl on you, Vince cried. Emma opened and twisted the knob and we entered room 33. I don't think I'll sleep for the next five years, Emma said, panting. It's good that we kept our composure and didn't get scared. Or maybe we were scared but didn't show it. Are you kidding me? I was scared out of my mind but I knew I'd be dead meat if that old hag sensed it. Vince said, panting. He lay down for a bit. The light in the room flicked open. A small theater-like stage with red velvet curtains now appeared in front of us. Six red velvet chairs with our names sewn with white thread stood before the stage. Please have a seat on the designated chairs. The private concert of our Romanian violin prodigy, Elenica Aaron, will commence shortly. Please turn off your mobile devices and enjoy this rare show. A woman's voice said from two speakers above the stage, we all sat down and turned off our phones as instructed. A gong sound made the room tremble. A few moments of silence followed. A thin man appeared and pulled the curtains to reveal the stage. An angelic, tall, blonde-haired woman dressed in a red dress stood on a chair with a violin between the side of her jaw and collarbone. Tears rolled down our faces the moment that she began playing. It was the most beautiful tune that I had ever heard. She cried too, rivers of tears slowly rolling down her cheeks and landing on the violin. She wore high heel shoes that shined as if made from crystalline diamonds. Rainbow colors illuminated the room. It was as if the instrument fed on her tears to play that song. My heart beat faster and I saw my friends couldn't move either. The violin song mesmerized us. Hypnotic in her playing, Inlika Aaron cried until their tears turned red. Blood now came from her eyes and it dripped on the violin. This felt wrong. Verlis used her for his own devices to once again satisfy his immense hunger by hurting people, by making them feel sad. The violin grew sharp spines that poked through the woman's fingers as blood fell on the wood. Now each drop of blood bloomed into a dark crimson rose until it covered the sides of the violin. The bow slowly swayed to and fro on the string, up and down, up and down. 
A myriad of feelings coursed through my body. I felt happy, sad, energized, and tired at the same time. I remembered my dad's laugh. He always encouraged me to be my best self. Elenka finished playing. She had two dark, black-red lines in her face and her eyes were the saddest thing that I had ever seen. The hand holding the violin was bloody too. The rose withered and fell off the instrument. She took a bow. A door opened behind her. You were brilliant. A few more performances like this and you can go back home to your family, the voice said. It was Verlis. That prick held her against her will to perform in this room for kids. He forced them to play a sick, supernatural game. The curtains closed and the lights turned off. The door that we had come in through opened again. We were silent for a few minutes, keeping our heads down low, looking at the floor. None of us could say anything, but we knew how each other felt deep inside. I wonder who that poor woman was. She seemed so sweet, yet sad and tired. Cassandra sighed. I'll remember her forever. Her song left something in me, a strange feeling that I don't think will ever go away, Vince said. As I mentioned in the beginning, he was the strong guy in our group of friends. Stern, gritty, and never took anything from anybody. I hadn't seen him before the way that he was after the song. I think we all feel the same way, Vince, Emma said. Guys, I don't want to be rude, but do you guys also feel fresh? Like super energized? I feel exactly as the rule said. David exhaled. We all said yes in unison. A light turned on on the left side of the side, illuminating a door. It opened by itself. I think we gotta go through there, right? Eddie said, pointing at the door. Here we go again, Vince replied. The smell of food hung in the air. Our stomachs growled instantly. We found ourselves standing in the kitchen. Man, I'm freaking hungry, Cassandra said. I think it's from the smell. Maybe it's getting us high or something like that, I replied, but it smells so delicious. A large pot boiled on top of the gas stove. A fish head stood on the counter, blood and guts beside it from what probably was an earlier evisceration. Jars filled with liquids that seemed expired and gross. Dirty knives, forks and spoons lay scattered on the kitchen counter and floor. One thing stood out in all that disgusting excuse of a kitchen. A large mason jar filled with gold coins. The sausage and other various types of meat were nailed to the ceiling. Also a pig's head was stuck in a spike on the left wall, with a bucket under it for the blood to drain. The pig had a sort of evil grin on its face and it looked right at us. The kitchen led to another room. Loud banging noises came from there. I heard a man's voice getting angry with each thud. Dang bones. Huh? What do I smell there? The man asked himself. The door busted open and the man stepped inside the kitchen and we froze. The man's belly was enormous and the goiter was so big that it covered his chin. Beads of sweat formed on his bald head as he looked at us with awe. Vegetable oil, blood and fish scales dripped from his long orange beard. He wore a ripped t-shirt with his cartoonized face that read, Papa Bud's Best Bites. Children, welcome, he exclaimed, belching. It's good to have you here. Excuse the mess. We all stood petrified as we watched that man. The spittle flew from his mouth whenever he talked and his rotten teeth added to his already horrific demeanor. At one point, I thought that I saw worms in the back of his throat, eating away at his amygdala. Fat dripped off his fingers. He wiped his hands on his dirty jeans, but the fat kept coming out of his fingers, as if it came from inside of his skin. He sweated a lot and belched even more. At first, I thought that he was an idiot, one big idiot, but of course, nothing was what it seemed in that house. And I also remembered the rule. 
we would get the gold coins only in exchange for a correct answer to one of his riddles. What's your name? Emma asked. We all glanced at her, letting her know with her eyes not to speak. No, oh, it says right here on the t-shirt, miss. Bud, but short for Budley. I used to be one of the best chefs in the world at some point, you know. But then Edgar Verlis came into my restaurant and he didn't like my food. He said that it tasted bland. Bland. I had three Michelin stars for Christ's sake, he said. He belched again and a cloud of thick green smoke came out of his mouth. Uh, radioactive breath, let me tell you. Phew. Another prisoner for Verlis's diabolical will. How did he make you come here? I asked. Well, he said he'd kill my mom if I didn't come and learn to cook here. He'd been giving me these green pills that make me go kind of insane in the brain. I see stuff that's not there, and that stuff that's not there, it tells me things. Right now, it says that I need to eat all you fingernails if you don't give me the right answer, he said. The man was crazy. I pitied him because it wasn't his fault. The demon Verlis made him like this. He made poor Bud go crazy and he didn't even know what he was doing anymore. Can we give you something else in exchange for the gold coins? Vince asked. No, Bud cried. We have to follow the rules. The rules are important to this house. If we follow the rules, nothing bad will happen. We all looked at each other in awe. The white in Bud's eyes had turned red and popped out of their sockets halfway. He stared at us with malicious intent as if possessed by an evil spirit. No, you only have 60 seconds to give a correct answer. If you don't have one, I'll pluck out your fingernails with these right here pliers. I'll take the ones off your feet too and make them into a delicious meal. Bud yelled. He was completely gone. His brain wiring scrambled beyond repair. The riddle was as follows. Not born, but from a mother's body drawn, I hang until half of me is gone. I sleep in a cave until I grow old, then valued for my heart in gold. What am I? Oh, what's the answer, children? You want the gold coins, don't you? Give me the answer. My heart wanted to burst out and run from my chest. The pressure and the stress became unbearable and I could imagine how Bud would slowly put off the nails from my fingers and toes. A shiver down my spine made me cringe at the thought. All right, all right, Vince screamed. So it's got to be food related. I mean, the guy's obsessed with food, right? I mean, look at this place, David asked. We had a fast debate and it comes from a mother, but it's not born. Good for consumption. Um, cow's milk. You hang it someplace dark until it turns to something gold. Um, it's gotta be cheese, right? Asked Emma. Hurry, 15 seconds. Belched Bud. Yeah, that's it. 10. I exhaled. 5, 4, 3. Cheese. It's cheese. I exclaimed. He smashed his fist against the table and roared like a wounded animal. He looked at us with crazy eyes and couldn't believe that he wouldn't have fingernails for supper that day. He nodded regretfully and proceeded to open the mason jar with gold coins. He carefully gave us one and pointed to the door that we had entered through. We hauled Bud in a second and found ourselves in a new room. Clocks ticked all around us. Both old and new clocks covered the walls, all showing different times. On the ceiling was a large clock with our faces drawn inside it. Hey, they missed my face on that thing, bummer. A kid's a ghastly voice whispered from behind us. What was that? Vince said. Oh, it's me, Oliver. I've been following you for quite some time. Rule number seven, right? Beware the uninvited guests, blah, blah, blah. Out of thin air, a kid with a torn striped pajama... He dragged a beat-up teddy bear with buttons instead of eyes. He was abnormally thin like a straw and translucent. I could see his ribs, organs, and intestines, everything through him. What happened to you, kid? David asked. He's been lying to you about everything. 
You won't get out of here alive. I tried to warn you from behind the door, but you wouldn't listen. So I had to sneak out and warn you all. I told you that I was once like you. He promised me and my friends money if we finished the challenge. We did finish and we got the key from the clockmaster. And then we went into the room with crystals where we were supposed to find the last rule of the game. The last rule said that one of my friends should stay here and the rest could go home. The alternative was that all of us would die, he said. Guess who stayed behind? How do we know you're not one of Verlis's tricks? Cassandra asked. You don't. You'll have to trust me if you want to live, Oliver replied. He went on with the story. Everyone in the floating house was dead. Some didn't even know it. Oliver knew it, but he said that he couldn't leave this place until somebody burned it to the ground. Bud was dead, trapped in Verlis's purgatory. Same with Elika. She thought that she would go home if she played a couple more concerts, but that wasn't bound to happen. That lady was spiders, well, she didn't even exist. Verlis made her real only to see if children got scared. If they did get scared, Verlis would be the one to eat them, not the woman. And the clockmaster, he had a shop in Zurich and Verlis went there to buy a watch. He liked the man and his skills and decided to make him his personal watchmaker. Alexander Meyer was his name. Verlis wanted a watch that moved backwards so that he could travel to the past and change it. The watchmaker told him that that was impossible, but Verlis told him to make it possible. He gave him power, his knowledge, and everything, but some things could never be attained. I was absolutely sure that he was telling the truth. We all gathered in a circle and we were on the same page. The ghost kid was legit. I'm buried under the floorboards, and we all are. He killed us and somehow didn't let us rest and brought us back to serve him. He loves this house, but right now he's just waiting in the room with crystals. He's resting until you get the second silver key. He gave you one in the beginning so that you could enter of your own free will. He gave you the hundred just for fun. But know that he wants your bodies and souls and one of you will die if you don't follow me. Or you'll all die. He sighed. He told us that he's been in this house for 250 years and all the children who came after never listened. Verlis killed them all, not many though, and discarded their bodies in the mountains, woods, rivers, deserts, and places that they would never be found. Oliver was all alone because Verlis wanted him to be, and to feel alone with nobody to talk to. I'm so sorry, Oliver, Cassandra said. We believe you. Show us the way and we'll help. Well, okay, so he likes to burn the bodies after they're dead. He likes the smell of the burning flesh. He's that sick. I watched him countless times. He takes a great pleasure in that, Oliver said. He told us that Verlis kept cans of gasoline in a tiny closet. He knew where it was and knew about a secret exit that he protected so that if anybody would ever listen to him, he could guide them to safety. Will it kill Verlis? asked Eddie. That monster needs to die so this wouldn't happen ever again. I sure hope so, said Oliver. Let's set this place of evil ablaze. We left the room with clocks and walked a long corridor where the cold wind howled and the air smelled like death. We entered the room where there were a few canisters of gasoline. Matchboxes stood on a shelf. I think you can carry one each, Oliver asked. Heck yeah, we can, replied Vince. I'll carry two even. Dave, you take two as well. Cass M, you take the matches and let's burn this mother down. After that, Oliver led us to a back door where he asked us to open it because he couldn't grab physical objects. I opened the door which led to the backwoods. We got out with the gas cans and Oliver stood at teary-eyed in the doorway. We got you, buddy. Rest easy now. You all need to pour the gas and light a match. The power of friendship is strong and can destroy evil. So long, my friends, Oliver said. The door closed shut. We circled the house and poured all the gasoline from the five-gallon cans. 
We lit the matches. To friendship. I love you guys, I said. You're my brothers and sisters, Vince said. Love y'all, David said. I love you lots, Emma said. Best friends forever, Cassandra said. I'll tattoo your names on my arm, I swear, said Eddie, giggling. We set the house on fire. Screams came from inside, along with high-pitched wails, as if whatever possessed it had died in agony. I could hear a familiar voice, tormented as the house turned to ashes. I will return someday. I am immortal. I will find you again, mark my words. I thought that I saw a flame shaped like Verlis's face. He glanced at me before the wind swept it away. After the flames ended, it seemed like nothing had ever happened there. The ghost house was no more and the ground was just as before. We all looked out at the stars. Some blinked as if saying hello and sending thanks. Maybe they went to the stars and beyond and wanted to let us know that everything was alright. I hope Oliver, Ilika, Bud, and Alexander will all be able to rest. And I also hope that Verlis rots below. Here's to true friends. I had a nasty breakup with my girlfriend a while back. And although we lived in an apartment together, she stood as the owner of it, so I had no choice but to move out. Thankfully, a good friend of mine allowed me to stay at her place until I could find my own crib. Since I only wanted a rental apartment, my choices were pretty limited. There is a low supply and high demand for rental apartments in my city. After going through several that were too expensive for me, I found a vacant one in the outskirts of the city. It was a large three-room apartment on the fourth floor, with a view over the woods and the rent was very low. I immediately applied and within a couple of hours, I got a reply that I could have it. I deeply regret moving here and now you may wonder why I haven't left. It's because the contract and the rules forbid me from leaving. The contract is for a year and honestly, I don't expect to survive until it expires. The same day as I moved in, I found a letter addressed to me from the company that rented it. I opened the letter and I took out the paper which said, Rules for living in the apartment complex. Rule number one. Regardless if you are home or away, your door must always be locked. You do not want to have unwanted guests in your apartment. Should you forget to lock the door after leaving, do not enter your apartment when you return. Call our support for instructions on how to proceed. Rule number two. It is not forbidden, but we do not recommend leaving the apartment between 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. Some entities like to roam the building during the night, and they do not take likely to intruders. This only implies if you want to leave your apartment and not if you return to it. Rule number three. If you leave the apartment between that time, always carry a flashlight, a bag of salt, and holy water. The flashlight will repel the shadowy figures that you may see. Should you hear footsteps behind you and no one is there, Use the salt to create a salt ring, and do not break it until the footsteps have stopped. The holy water is for any people you may encounter. To make sure it's an actual person, spray it on them. Should they react to it, immediately run back to your apartment, and stay there until 5am. If they do not react, it's safe to proceed. Rule number 4. The basement should never be visited under any circumstances between 11pm to 5am. If you should ignore this rule, then there is a high risk that you may never leave it. Rule number 5. If you are in the basement at any given time, with exception to rule number 4, and you hear growls behind you, ignore them and calmly walk to the exit and do not run, because the thing that makes the sound will catch you if you do. Rule number 6. 
On Mondays and Thursdays, your doorbell will ring at exactly 3 a.m. Approach the door as silently as you can and look through the people. There will be an old man with a fancy hat outside. Invite him in and politely ask him if he wants food. It doesn't matter what food you give him. After he has finished the food, he will thank you for your kindness and leave the apartment. Do not refuse him, because if you do, then you die. Rule number 7. Should objects in your apartment move between locations, pour the liquid we have provided you with on them and it will stop. The liquid is located underneath the sink in the kitchen. No harm will be done to you if you fail to do this, but there is a risk that some objects will never be seen again. Rule number 8. Do not stare into the mirror for longer than 5 minutes at a time. Should you forget about this rule, your own reflection will remain and slowly make its way out of it. If this happens, smash the mirror before it can get out. Rule number 9. Every apartment has an intercom with the name of those who lives here and the number of their apartment. If you wish to visit any tenants, dial them and ask for their permission to visit. Should the doorbell ring and a tenant ask to come in, do not answer them and remain silent. It's not a tenant as they would never come visit you before calling first. Rule number 10. If you receive mail that is not addressed by the company emblem, do not touch it with your hands. Use a glove or something else to pick it up and immediately burn it. Should you pick it up, the mailman will visit you the next day and trust us, you do not want to meet him. Rule number 11. If the light in your apartment turns off between 9.15 and 9.20 p.m., find a place to hide until they have been turned on again. And do not worry, the creature won't find you as long as you are hiding. Rule number 12. Any visitor, meaning visitors outside tenants, must also follow the rules. If they break them, then both you and they will suffer the consequences. Rule number 13. And do not try and leave or move out until your contract expires. If you try and do this, then no matter where you go or who you visit, you will always return to your apartment. I read through the rules repeatedly. Luckily for me, I've read about rules such as this on Reddit and I know the seriousness of breaking them. However, it doesn't mean that they didn't scare the living hell out of me. To calm myself down, I made a cup of coffee and I went to watch TV. A few moments later, I heard the doorbell ring which made me jump and spill my coffee, but somehow, I managed to stay quiet. Hello? A female voice said, but I didn't answer and I sat quietly on the sofa, shaking with fear. Is anyone home? The voice continued, not much louder and menacing, but I remained quiet. I know you're home. Let me in. It said now in a demonic voice, and it started to bang on the door with each bang, having enough force to knock the door down, but it held. This continued for 10 minutes until it stopped. After a couple of more minutes, I got the courage to go to the door and look out the peephole, and nothing was there. I sighed and went back to the sofa. I looked at the clock and it said, 9.14 p.m., Remembering the rule, I went to my wardrobe as a precaution to have a chance to hide, since my encounter with Nine had shaken me to the core. As it turned to 9.15, the lights went out and I entered it and covered my mouth. I did not see what entered my apartment, but it was big based on the heavy footsteps it made. I could hear it sniffing around and it took every amount of my willpower to stay quiet. It then left and the lights were turned on again. I carefully exited the wardrobe and sighed as the creature had vanished. After that event, I could not go to sleep, so I decided to watch TV, but somehow fell asleep and woke up to the sound of my doorbell ringing. I looked at my phone and it said 3am. This made me wide awake and I approached the door with trembling steps and I looked through the peephole. My entire body froze as I saw the old man with the fancy hat. 
I took a few seconds to collect myself and I opened the door. I would have expected a ghastly looking figure, but he looked like a normal person. He appeared to be in his mid-70s with pale complexion, messy gray hair, dark colored eyes, and wore a nice black tuxedo with a purple tie. However, I knew this wasn't an ordinary person, because every cell on my body screamed danger. The old man looked me up and down and said in a friendly voice, May I come in? Of course, sir. I replied as friendly as I could. The man thanked me and entered the apartment. He took off his hat and put it on the shelf and went to the dinner table and sat down. As I closed the door and locked it, I said to the man, Can I offer you some food? And he replied, Yes, I would like that. I nervously went to the kitchen to put together a dish and while I did, the man stared at me without blinking. It sent shivers down my spine. I served him some chicken with rice and looked nervously at him as he ate my meal. After he was finished, he stood up and walked towards me and said, Thank you for the meal and your kindness. Before grabbing his hat and walking through the door, he literally passed right through the door. After he had left, I started hyperventilating and it took several minutes for me to calm down. I thought in the morning after work, I'll go shopping for protective material against the supernatural stuff. Not long after that, I fell asleep from sheer exhaustion and I awoke to my alarm clock. The following couple of days, nothing paranormal happened to me and I did not leave my apartment during the evening and night, but I bought several protective charms during my lunch break. However, the next day when I came home, I saw a letter lying in the doormat and I bent down to grab it. But before I could do so, I remembered rule number 10. If you receive mail that is not addressed by the company emblem, do not touch it with your hands. Use a glove or something else to pick it up and immediately burn it. Should you pick it up, the mailman will visit you the next day and trust us. You do not want to meet him. I put on a glove and I picked it up and I'm glad that I did because it did not have the rental company's logo on it. I went and grabbed a lighter and set it on fire and when I did, it released a horrifying scream that made me drop it and I looked down in horror as blue flames consumed it. As I prepared my dinner, I couldn't find the frying pan in the kitchen locker. I remembered rule number seven. Should objects in your apartment move between locations, pour the liquid that we have provided you with on them and it'll stop. The liquid is located underneath the sink in the kitchen. No harm will be done to you if you fail to do this, but there is a risk that some objects will never be seen again. I took the bottle containing the liquid underneath the sink and I searched for it. I found it in the bedroom on the bed and I poured the liquid on it but nothing happened to my surprise. After making dinner and browsing Reddit and YouTube, I decided to take a shower before heading to bed. As I stood in the shower, the lights went out, causing me to freeze before snapping out of it and immediately turn the shower off. Rule number 11. If the light in your apartment turns off between 9.15pm to 9.20pm, find a place to hide until they've been turned on again. Do not worry. The creature won't find you as long as you are hiding. I didn't dare to move and I thanked myself for remembering to put up the shower drape. I heard the creature walking around and sniffing the apartment. It eventually left, but I waited a couple more minutes before turning the shower on again and luckily nothing happened to me. As I stepped out of the shower, I froze in fear and cursed at myself for my stupidity. As I remembered, I did not lock the door after entering and finding the letter. I rushed butt naked out of the bathroom to the door and locked it and prayed nothing had entered. I quickly went to put an amulet that I bought on and as I did, it started to burn on my chest. Crap, I thought as my fight or flight mode had activated. I rushed to grab my waist bag. Yes, I have one. 
and put my phone, a flashlight, a bag of salt, and a bottle of holy water in it, and grab the keys as I left the apartment and made sure to lock it. I looked at the phone and it said, 11pm. How is this possible, I thought. There is no way in hell that it has been nearly two hours since I had stepped out of the shower. Rule number three. If you leave the apartment between that time, always carry a flashlight, a bag of salt, and holy water. The flashlight will repel the shadowy figures you may see. Should you hear footsteps behind you, and no one is there, use the salt to create a salt ring, and do not break it until the footsteps have stopped. The holy water is for any people that you may encounter. To make sure they're real, spray it on them. Should they react to it, immediately run back to your apartment and stay there until 5am. If they do not react, it's safe to proceed. I walk through the hallway, yes, butt naked, and every hair on my body stood up and I felt uneasy. I saw three shadowy figures, but I used the flashlight on them and as the rule had said, they vanished. When I entered the staircase, I heard footsteps behind me. I cursed and took the bag of salt and I poured a ring around myself. I don't know how long I stood there, but I kept my eyes shut as I heard laughter and screaming around me. Apparently, they left that out from the rule. It eventually stopped, so I broke the ring and went on my way, and luckily, I saw no people. After leaving the apartment complex, I ran to the nearest 7-Eleven store, which was around 15 minutes away on foot. When I arrived at the 7-Eleven butt naked, the staff was in the simple words surprised and horrified, but I had managed to convince them to let me in by saying that I was robbed. They gave me some clothes and allowed me to use the staff room as they called the police. After calming down, I decided to call the company's support and inform them what had happened. The conversation went like this. This is redacted support. What can I help you with? A female voice said. Hey, this is John from Apartment XX. I have a major problem that I need assistance. You broke rule one, didn't you? The woman said, slightly annoyed. John, we'll send a team to your apartment. It'll take us two days to fix things until then. You will be provided with a guest room at one of our other apartment complexes. That place has a list of rules that are slightly different from the ones that you have. Follow them and you'll be fine. Since this is a first time offense, you will not receive any punishment. We'll send a car to pick you up. Wait, what about which she had already hung up on me. Well, isn't this great, I thought, when one of these staff had entered and told them the cops are there. I told them what I had told the staff and I saw that they didn't believe me, but they just dismissed me as being a weirdo. After they had left, I thanked the 7-Eleven staff for helping me, and I went out where a black sedan had waited for me. An hour later, I arrived at a guest apartment, it was a two-room apartment with a kitchen and bathroom. On the bed were a box with my belongings and a letter. I went and picked up the letter which said, Rules for living in the guest room apartment. Rule 1. Do not leave the guest room under any circumstances until you receive a call from the company support. Rule 2. Do not look in the mirror in the bathroom at any point. It will take it as an invite. You will feel very tempted to look in it. So, our advice is to use a blindfold whenever you have to use the bathroom. Rule 3. Should you look in the mirror, then pray the entity takes pity on you. Rule 4. Always place a plate of food underneath the bed before going to sleep. Should you forget about this, then there is a risk that you will be the meal. The food is stored underneath the sink. Rule 5. If an old lady by the name of Anna knocks on your door at any point and asks you to help her, Ignore her and do not approach the door. She will disappear after five minutes. Should you not do so, then you will be dead in the morning. Rule number six. If you hear three taps on the window, ignore it as it wants your attention. If you hear two taps followed by three quick taps, find a place to hide until it is stopped. If you hear a crash while in hiding, it had managed to enter your apartment. Remain quiet, as it can only find you if you make a noise. After three minutes, it will disappear. 
Rule 7. If you hear laughter from the ceiling, do not look up. Ignore it and it will eventually stop. My heart sank after reading the rules. I went from one hellish place to an even more hellish place. I went through my stuff and thankfully all my protective gear was there. I thought about calling the police but dreaded what could happen to them. I sighed and thought that I will just not break the rules. I will survive. After my little pep talk, I placed out various protective gear and after I was finished I sat down on the couch to watch some TV before dozing off. I was jolted awake to both my amulets burning like the sun on my chest and to the sound of three taps on the window and luckily I had put the drapes over them. My heart pounded so hard it felt like it would escape my body but overcoming the burning pain of the amulet I managed to remain quiet. It went on for 10 minutes before I heard two taps, followed by three quick taps. Holy crap, I thought, and quickly but quietly made my way to the bedroom and I hid in the wardrobe. A few seconds later, the window broke, and I heard the most horrifying growl that nearly made me scream, but I managed to cover my mouth. I stood there quietly as the creature roamed the apartment. It eventually entered the bedroom and I saw it through a crack in the door. It looked like a dog, except it had gray scales and limbs with claws that resembled talons, and its face was terrifying, burning red eyes with a wide mouth full of fangs. It searched through the bedroom before disappearing, and as it did, the amulet stopped burning and I exited the wardrobe. When I went back to the living room, the window was fixed and there was no sign that the creature had ever been there. I looked at my watch and it said 11.15pm. Great, only 28 more hours in this place. I went back to the couch and that was when I heard it. A demonic laughter coming from above me, at the same time as a loud knock on the door. Hey, this is Anna, your neighbor. Could you help me with my groceries? The woman or whatever the heck that thing was said in a surprisingly warm tone. And the laughter became louder as the thing at the door said that and my amulet burned so much that I had to take it off. I looked down and saw that it had left a burn mark on my chest. I started to quietly sob and I silently muttered, Why the heck did I have to endure all this stuff? I just wanted it to end. Five minutes later the knocking and the laughter stopped. As if my body had moved on its own, I quickly went and picked up the food underneath the sink and put it on a plate and placed it underneath the bed. I then fell on top of the bed and the next I knew, I woke up to the sound of my phone ringing. This is John, I stammered. And this is Teresa from the support. We're all finished with your apartment and some of our workers will come and pick you up. I sighed in relief and laughed maniacally after she had hung up, as I realized I had slept for nearly 28 hours. Two hours later, I sat in the car on my way back to my apartment. I noticed that I had put my amulet in my pocket, and the moment that I touched the amulet, it burned my fingers. As it burned, my heart sank and I thought this was the end of the line for me. I lit the driver which appeared to be human, but the amulet and instinct said that he was not. If this is the end then I might as well put everything on the line, because what else do I have to lose? I took a few moments to gather up my courage and I asked, Are you from the company or are you something else? And I got no response. I asked you a question, I said in an angrier tone. He then turned around and almost gave me a heart attack. He had pale skin with hollow eyes and no other facial features and he waved his hand, causing me to lose consciousness. Next thing I knew, I woke up in my apartment and felt more rested than I've ever been. I got up and went to make coffee to make sense of what had happened since the guest apartment. It was then that I found a letter at the door. Remembering the rule, I looked at it and the letter had the company logo on it. And this is what it said. John, you've lasted longer than any other guest before, and you've proven yourself capable of surviving the horrors of this place. We are very impressed with you and want to offer you a position within our company. If you join us, John, 
We will nullify your contract and you will be free to live your life. But you will serve us until you die. Should you not accept our offer, then good luck at surviving until your contract with us expires. We want your answer as quickly as possible. Don't forget, the rules still apply. The Owner What's in the everlasting hell, I thought, and I dropped my coffee. I read the letter repeatedly and it sent chills down my spine every time that I read it. Thousands of thoughts rushed through my mind and I had to sit down. I can't do this anymore. And so I went and grabbed my cell phone and it said at 7pm. I called my friend who I stayed with before moving and told her that I'm in desperate need of help. She arrived 30 minutes later to my place and I nearly crushed her in a hug. After talking for a few minutes I showed her the rules. If you've forgotten about them, well, here they are. She looked at me like I was going to burst out saying, It's a prank. But my serious expression told her that I was a dead serious. I then showed her the letter that I received and she looked at me questioning and said, Why did you give me an empty paper? This sent off alarm bells in my head as I could perfectly read what it said. Now, you may wonder why I did something like this, bringing in a visitor because I wanted to see if I was still sane or if I had completely lost it. You know what, John? This was a mistake, she replied, and she went to grab her coat when the doorbell rang. I sprinted towards her and said in a whisper, Do not answer it. Hello, may I come in? A male voice said, What's the matter with you? She replied silently, only for her body to stiffen as it said, You must let me in. Open the door. In that same demonic voice that made my blood freeze. I dragged her back to the couch and we sat in silence. As the demon or whatever it was banged and yelled for us to let it in. After it had stopped, she looked at me in fear and said, Is this for real? Have you been living like this all the time? I nodded in response and told her that you must follow the rules. I then told her about everything that had happened to me since I had moved in, including the letter that only I could read. You gotta do something, John. and Call the cops, the FBI, the freaking army, she said after I finished my story. You don't think I've thought about that, but what would I say? Hey, I live in a supernatural apartment where some deeply disturbing stuff goes on, and I have to follow a list of rules that sets off supernatural calamities. They would send me to a mental asylum. Before we could continue our conversation, the lights went out and my amulet began to burn again. Come on, I said, and I grabbed her and rushed into the bathroom and put the drape up around the bathtub. The creature arrived and I had to hold her mouth to prevent her from screaming. We stood dead silent as the creature sniffed around. I had counted how long it's been since the lights went out and it had been more than five minutes. Crap, I thought now terrified. This isn't supposed to happen. Just as I heard a deep growl coming from inside the bathroom. However, as the creature approached us, the lights went on and the movement stopped. But the amulet was still burning. It was then that I realized my mistake. I tore down the drape, grabbed her hand, and we made a run to the door. I had completely forgotten that I have a little mirror in the shower bar facing the direction that I stood in. As we made our way to the door, I looked back and saw... A twisted version of myself smiling at us. I unlocked the door and managed to shut it as the twisted version of me ran into it. What on the earth was that? She asked terrified as we ran through the hallways. Something messed up, I replied. I heard a demonic laughter behind us as the evil me had managed to leave the apartment and it ran after us. We approached the stairwell only to have the creature from before stand in front of it. I'm sorry, I said to her, for getting you involved. While I make a run for it, I will lead them away from you and give you the chance to get away. I'm not listening for a reply. I took off. My idea worked as they went off after me. As I ran from evil me and a large, dog bear like creature with gray fur, burning eyes and a twisted face, an idea came into my head. I ran to another staircase and then down to the basement with them following me. I had managed to open the door to the basement fully. 
The two creatures rushed into it and as they did, I pulled the door shut. I could hear a terrifying growl from within as they banged on the door trying to escape before going silent. I sat down at the door, not realizing how out of breath I was. After resting for a few minutes, I went back to my apartment and on my way there, the amulet did not burn. I sat down on the couch when my phone rang. With shaking hands, I looked at it, and the display said, unknown number. I answered it and heard a very deep and dark voice say, Well done, John. You've exceeded my expectations. That move by using the rules against themselves was very clever. The clock is ticking and I'm growing impatient. Will you take my offer or not? I'll take the offer. I replied to whatever the thing was on the phone, and immediately its tone changed from a deep and menacing to a calm and polite one. Excellent. We will send you a car within the hour and once you arrive, you will be given your first task. The thing replied and hung up. Immediately afterwards, I felt a sense of relief. It was like whatever evil that was present had disappeared. However, what I didn't know was that this feeling would be replaced with a much more terrifying one. An hour later, I heard a knock on the door. I walked to it carefully and opened it and a seven-foot-tall man with pale skin and no hair or facial features, except a pair of hollow eyes with a blue uniform that said, The Mailman stood there. I stared at the being in horror and took a few steps back. Despite not having a mouth, it spoke to me in a very dark voice and distorted tone. Your car is here. And gestured me to follow him. I complied because my fear of what would happen if I didn't outweighed my rational thinking. I grabbed my coat and followed the demonic mailman through the hallway with trembling steps and expected something would jump me. However, nothing happened and the next couple of hours were blurry because the moment I sat down in the car, I passed out. I woke up in a white room with no doors or windows and only a red office chair with a man sitting in it. You're awake. That's good. The man said and turned the chair around. I expected another horror figure to sit in it, but to my surprise, the being looked like an ordinary human. He appeared to be in his mid-sixties with gray hair, dark brown eyes, and a light complexion. He was tall, much taller than me and wore a red tuxedo. I felt dread filling my body when he flicked his hand, and he pulled the amulet from me. No, oh, you won't be needing this anymore, and he crushed it between his hand. My name is Apollon, and I'm the owner of this company. As he raised his hand and brought me kneeling in front of him, I was terrified and I couldn't stop shaking. I remembered that I've heard that name sometime before, but I couldn't make the connection. He looked at me and laughed. No need to be afraid, John. I won't harm you unless you give me a reason to do so. And he gestured for me to stand up. You took my offer. Good but to be sure that you are sincere with your decision and not trying to use it to save yourself, I will give you a task. If you fulfill it, then I know you are a part of us. However, if you do not, then I will make you experience things that are beyond anything you've experienced at the apartment. Dang, I thought. He saw right through me. What is it that you want me to do? I asked, still terrified. He smiled at me and waved his hand and I found myself back at the apartment with a note that said, I want you to give me three souls you are choosing that you have a personal tie to. As I read it, I heard a knock on the door and as I opened it, the demonic mailman entered. I felt tears running down my face and I wanted to scream. I shook with fear and anger as I not only realized what I had to do, but also who I dealt with. Abaddon, I said loudly, which caused the mailman to form a smile on his face, using his fingers. It's been about a month since that I took the job offer, and provided three souls to the demon, Abaddon. I won't disclose who I choose because I'm deeply ashamed of my actions, but I'm free from the rules. I'm allowed to spend my time how I see fit. However, when Abaddon reaches out to me, I must answer... I'm terrified all the time, and I've started drinking and I barely sleep. I've done some horrible things. 
I tried one time to refuse and that made me experience horror that made everything I had felt in the apartment look like a children's movie. I traded myself from something horrifying to something far more horrifying. The worst part is that, beneath the constant fear, I'm beginning to enjoy my new job. Now my job is to write and enforce supernatural rules for a rental company, and my current target is a new apartment building where my ex-girlfriend and her new boyfriend will move into. I've come up with a really good set of rules, probably some that you are really familiar with.